I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. May I please have a motion to certify closed session? Madam Chair, I certify to the best of each member's knowledge the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Mrs. Young. May I have a second, please? A second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? <coughs> Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Motion passes. Um, that brings us to the Pledge of Allegiance. Would Berkeley Middle School 8th grade students Victoria Gallant and Jackson Zahn please come and lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. May I please have a motion for approval of the agenda? Madam Chair, I move that we accept the agenda as presented. Second. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, it's been first, and, um, made, motion's been made and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. The agenda is approved. That brings us to 4.01 announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Jamestown High School student Abigail Polanski's license plate design has been selected as one of the top eight designs in the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles Take Action Against Distraction license plate design contest. Nearly 200 students submitted designs, and each of the eight district finalists will receive $300 from AAA Mid-Atlantic, sponsor of the contest. The public will choose the design it thinks best depicts an anti-distracted driving message through an online vote. Public voting begins February 20th and will run through March 20th of this year. A photo, Gail, a photo of Abigail, her license plate design, and her art teacher, Missy Furr, is on the front page of the division website. We've also provided a link to the DMV voting site, and I encourage our community to rally behind Abigail and vote for her winning license plate. Thank you, Ms. Furr and Jamestown High uh, ITRT, Amanda Morris, for working together in, on this project and providing a great opportunity to Jamestown students. The WJCC course Planning and Curriculum Affairs are next week at the Williamsburg Community Chapel. The middle school night will be February 26th and high school students will have their course planning night on February 27th. Visit the division's website for specific times for each grade level. I believe a day has not passed that we have not thought of the terrible tragedy last week in Marjorie Sonam Douglas High School, Florida. I wanted to state publicly that our thoughts and prayers go out to the families, students, teachers, administrators, everyone impacted by this tragedy. The safety of our students and staff is of utmost importance, and I'm extremely grateful for the partnerships we have with law enforcement agencies in the city and the county who work with us every single day to keep our students safe. Finally, a reminder that March 2nd is a full day for all students. This calendar adjustment was, was made due to the days we missed for snow. And those are all of the announcements I have this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Ms. Ownby? Yes, Madam Chair. Wanted to update on SEAC's uh, activities. They met two weeks ago, and as they've wrapped up their organizational work, they are eager to serve as a working committee and are looking for guidance from the board as to areas impacting special education that they could 
research and identify best practice for our division to consider. So we're eager to 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 work. Um, they're eager to work to to have that communication and identify their next project. Thank you, Ms. Ombi. Anybody else? That brings us to item 5.01, board recognitions. Madam Chair, we have several individuals to recognize tonight. Let's begin by honoring the newest WJCC school's national board certified teachers. This highly respected professional certification requires teacher candidates to complete a rigorous year-long process to examine, document, and reflect upon their teaching and its impact upon student learning. This process also includes an assessment to demonstrate depth of content knowledge and pedagogy within their specialty. Teachers, as your name is called, please join us up front to be recognized and remain for a group photo. Melissa Che. Catherine Chall. Kristen Cosby. I believe Kristen has a spe uh, scheduling conflict tonight and, and can't attend, but we congratulate her even if she's not here for, for the great accomplishment. Kelly Herzbold. Molly Pete. <laughs> Rachel Samuels. Don't see Rachel in the audience tonight either. Emily Smucker. Ellen Turner. And Elizabeth Williams. This is truly an incredible accomplishment. Please join me in congratulating these teachers for, for such an outstanding job. As they're lining up for their photograph this evening, um, just to let you know, WJCC Schools now has a total of 56 National Board Certified Teachers. So well done, we're very proud of you. This evening, we also want to recognize three Lafayette athletes for being named to the Class 4 All-State Football First Team for the fall sports seasons. Student, as your, students, as your name is called, please join us up front. Armani Burden, First Team Defense. <laughs> Jack Irwin, First Team Defense. Seth Osborne, First Team Defense. Congratulations, students, and pause for a photograph as well. 
Sure. Coaches want to join your students at the front of the room to get your photograph taken. Well done, Coach Lynn, as well. <laughs> Madam Chair, those are all of the recognitions we have this evening. We'll, we'll have more recognitions, including the WJCC Schools Teachers of the Year at the regular meeting in March. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. That brings us to the next item, School Spotlight, Berkeley Middle School. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Mr. Chigaritas, Principal of Berkeley Middle School, who will present the school this evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. I'm proud to stand before you tonight to represent Berkeley Middle School. As a Principal of Berkeley over the last seven months, I've noticed Berkeley has a rich history stretching all the way back to the 1960s. Over the summer, I met with 75 parents and students and attempted to see what things Berkeley was doing well and what challenges it had. The overwhelming theme in those conversations was that Berkeley had strong content teachers and teachers that have a genuine understanding of their students. Parents and students both felt that Berkeley staff was an extension of their family and the building was a home away from home. During one of my meetings, I met with Ms. Adrian Holmes, who is a member of the graduating class in 1968, which represented the last predominantly black class to graduate from Williamsburg James City County Public Schools. She told me she was there because she wanted to host the 50th anniversary of her class at Berkeley. And she said she did it because that was her home. She said that she remembered all her teachers and she told me a whole bunch of stories, some that are inappropriate to say here. <laughs> but it made me smile knowing that you know, she thought of that place as home. One of the reasons why I chose to spotlight Berkeley in February is not only because it's Black History Month, which represents a tradition and diversity of the children of Berkeley from 1960 to now, but I also chose February because it is associated with a month of love and people hold Berkeley close to their hearts. Being a Williamsburg native, Berkeley was my rival in middle school. But even back then, students loved Berkeley, and they were known for their avid school spirit. As principal, I have a newfound love for Berkeley. As staff members have said, they want it to be a school that will improve the community as it, it is embedded within and serves, to be a school with a shared vision to, and to hold students to high expectations and standards, to be a school with high levels of collaboration and communication, and to be a school that has feedback which can produce great teachers and students, all while creating a culture of high family and community involvement. With that in mind, I would like to present Berkeley Middle School. Thank you. I'm the proud principal of Berkeley Middle School, home of the Bulldogs. In honor of February being Black History Month and the month that we celebrate love, I'd like to tell you a few reasons why I love Berkeley. I love Berkeley because of the wealth of knowledge that teachers bring and the authentic relationships that they build with students. I also think the diversity of our children and our programs are important. We offer art, band, chorus, and a variety of athletic programs that our kids can be involved in. There's a place at Berkeley for every student. No matter where you fit in, Teachers are here willing to extend a helping hand. I love Berkeley because all the teachers go out of their way to help everybody. Um, I'm on the basketball team and we have, it's an eighth grade and seventh grade team and everyone always is a team, they work together. The teachers are always willing to like help us. They let us do our homework before if we have a game or something. I like morning news because it's a completely student run program. There's a camera person, there's a pledge person, there's a books on hold and lost and found person, and it's really nice how it always runs together. One of the things that I love is that they have a women's robotics program for after school where um, women 
who are majoring in computer science and robotics from William & Mary come in and they talk to us and they teach us about computer programming. I love all the programs that they have here. The library program, uh, there's only four students. Uh, we have lots of responsibilities. We get to learn many life skills here. Um, we get to do projects. Like I'm, we're John defining the library currently and I get to check in books, check out books, and it's, it's a great opportunity just to do that. I love Berkeley because theater and the choir, how it makes me feel confident in myself and the people around me. It feels like family to me. I love this school because the sports that we have. In my opinion, sports keeps me out of trouble. I want to go somewhere in life to play sports. I'm doing better in school. My grades are improving a lot. I love the, the variety of programs that we're able to offer here from our arts programs, of course our sports programs and all of our strong academic programs too. Just being able to really uh, help each student find what they are even passionate about as a, as a middle school student. I love it because I'm on an activity, which is a set team, and when I'm mad or sad or I have, I can't express my feelings, I can take it out by doing step. When I walk through the building, I feel like I'm at home, like I didn't leave my house. Does anyone have any uh, questions or comments for Mr. Chikoridis? You may want to come back in case anyone. At least let us thank you. Oh, my first word, yeah. Mr. Keller? Did you have no, good. <laughs> Sorry, some of it you have. Sorry, we're having some technical <laughs> considerations up here. I'll help sure. you in just a second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chikoridis, for sharing. Thank you. Um, yeah. Definitely there's a, a feeling of, of warmness and family and connection. And I love, I love the fact that WJCC offers not only um, sound academics, but, but arts and extracurriculars and athletics. And all of the students are very connected to their school. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. As a bulldog parent, I'm very grateful for your leadership there. And it is a wonderful school. I'm glad to have been a part of it for many years. I think you would be more dedicated if you bought a bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> and then you brought it to all the sporting events. I'll look they're, into that. I gotta look at the policy for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was my my kids were Berkeley Bulldogs through and through, and it's a great school. So thanks for sharing all the richness of the Thank the you. programs there. It is one of the mascots I'm missing. Uh oh. No. So we have to, okay. We have to get a picture of the mascot with Mr. Kelly. He's going to be in the, he's going to be in the building Friday. Okay. <laughs> so. I'll, I'll have him ready to go. He's really. Um, our mascot is interested in going to mascot school, so okay. we're, we're, we'll work with him. And I appreciate your guys' support um, in the role that I'm in. Um, I didn't mention it, although it was mentioned at the last uh, meeting. I just want to appreciate and recognize your hard work because it is School Board Appreciation Month. So on behalf of Berkeley, we just want to thank you for the hard work that you put in and the uh, support that you give our school and all the schools in Williamsburg, James City County. Thank you. Thank you very much. To um, citizen comments, and because of the number of speaker cards we have, we're going to uh, allocate two minutes for each speaker. Um, I can't read it because I can't see it. Okay. <laughs> we're having our technical Sorry, difficulties. Excuse us just a second. There we go. All right. All right. And, um, so we're going to uh, allocate two minutes per speaker. Ms. Hummel, will you please read? Yes. Instructions. Okay, this is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker is allocated two minutes uh, tonight, and time cannot be yielded to another speaker. <laughs> Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to any specific individuals. 
The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Ms. Ombi? Tip Morris. Good evening, I'm Tip Morris, and I gladly take this much appreciated much appreciated opportunity to address the school board to ask all of you to please reflect upon the questions and potential procedural problems raised in the following before proceeding to approve the proposed revisions to our POS. And if any of you are troubled by any of this at all, I urge each of you to seek answers in public here tonight preferably, if not for the benefit of your own knowledge as the divisions ultimate and buck stops here decision making then at least for the sakes of goals number nine and ten under the division's fourth and fifth priorities which call respectively for honest and consistent communication with families community and staff and for developing and maintaining a transparent strategic management system linked to key budget decision firstly the biggest potential, perhaps procedural problem, stems from the fact that we have been for so very long one of the few divisions with at least implicit approval to exceed VDO's minimum requirements, and that before even considering to amend or discontinue these precious and important grandfathered rights, VDO requires you, us, to follow the steps found in the Virginia Superintendent's Memo Number 029-12, which includes first, officially and publicly approving a request to make any amendments to existing uh, graduation requirements that exceed the minimum, and then submitting that request to Richmond and waiting for us to decision. If the procedure outlined in Memo 0212 02912 has not been superseded, and I can't find where it has been, and if the results of my many fruitless searches of board docs for evidence that you have officially made that request are correct, then I urge each of you to pause and ask yourself before tonight's vote if any of you can recall approving such a request subsequent to your approval of the current 1718 version of our POS. <clears throat> And if none of you can recall such a vote, I urge you even more strongly to consider the possible ramifications proceeding tonight before having officially requested, much less having officially received VDOs required. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Approval. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Jennifer Beckham Mendez. Uh. Good evening, Dr. Heron and members of the school board, and thank you for this opportunity to address you today. My name is Jennifer Bicca Mendez. I'm a Lafayette High School parent and a resident of James City County. One should speak about one, one, what one knows. I know about two things. I know about my son and daughter and what it has meant to, been, what it has meant to raise them here in Williamsburg, two children of Hispanic heritage. I also know about international curricula in higher education. As a college professor at William & Mary for the last 18 years, and someone with eight years of experience administering international interdisciplinary academic programs at William & Mary, I can say with certainty that continuing the erosion of the world language program is misguided. I've consulted with my colleagues in modern languages at William & Mary. I would like to elaborate at least three reasons why this is a bad idea. First, the study of language promotes cross-cultural learning and understanding that is central to both citizenship and professional life in the 21st century. In a networked global labor market, language and cultural skills are highly valued. This hardly seems to me to merit further elaboration. It's such a widely accepted claim that I'm making here. Second, WJCC graduates will be at a disadvantage in college if they have not laid the necessary groundwork to meet college language requirements. I say this because I know this from my professional experience, okay? For example, at William & Mary, we assume that language proficiency is a prerequisite for college. Um, our students, their peers from other college will, 
from other high schools will have been introduced to the study of non-English languages in seventh grade or, or younger, our students will have to play catch up. Third, it hurts students to delay language study. The tweaking of the curriculum that's proposed, instead of making things better, is going to make things worse. Um, what my colleague calls the wheel of fortune approach to language with the sampler course is not supported by any language pedagogy. One easy remedy might be to eliminate the sampler course in order to introduce language earlier at a developmentally appropriate time. And finally, cutting the world language program is a blow to inclusion Thank and diversity. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you. you. Atlee Paterno. Good evening, WJCC School Board. My name is Atlee Paterno, and I'm a senior at Lafayette High School. I stand before you today, as do many of my peers, in hopes of successfully expressing my concerns regarding the prospective changes to the World Language Program. I am a current member of the French National Honor Society and a former French student of Madame Collins, who is here tonight. I have known her for seven years, and I've taken both French cinema and AP French with her, and it was quite possibly the most enriching experience of my life. Throughout my linguistic career, Madame Collins has instilled in me the importance of cultural involvement. These two classes were not only able to refine my existing knowledge of the language, but exposed me to culture that I would otherwise not have had the opportunity to appreciate. Because I took these classes and have received a four on my AP exam, I am now considered fluent in French. Without the guidance of Madame Collins, I simply would not have been able to thrive as I did. It saddens me that there are plans to eliminate French cinema, and I am concerned that the trend will fall into AP. By this I mean that neither class will become a priority and that it will never be taught in person again. In my eyes, as well as many of others here tonight, personal human interactions are absolutely essential to furthering one's pursuit of a foreign language. Without having, or excuse me, without having my peers as well as Madame Collins to discuss the content, I would not be as motivated to fully comprehend the subject matter. As I have personal experience taking an online class, I know how easy it is to disregard the material and to see it as assignments that just need to be finished for a credit towards my diploma. diploma excuse me. Putting AP language and cinema courses online completely devalues the material and does not allow students to have a sense of involvement. Um, the ways in which these upper level courses have impacted my life are innumerable. I was able to travel to France with my class path this past fall, give back to the community, and I will be minoring in language at the College of William & Mary this fall as a result of her <laughs> wonderful in-class instruction. So to conclude, I'd like to say that it is simply an insult to the time, effort, and passion that my peers, as well as Madame Collins and the other language teachers, have devoted to their jobs. And I hope you rethink your decision. Thank you, Ms. Paterna. Thank you. Eric Hurt. <coughs> Good evening, board members, Dr. Heron. Uh, I am uh, here to co-opt the phrase erosion of your commitment to languages. Um, I'm the father of six. Uh, I have been a, a parent of a high school attendee since 2006, and my last will graduate in 2024. Uh, so I have some perspective on this language thing. Uh, and as I could speak over and over about how it makes you a better world, Remember uh, what you can do with language, but let me give you a more specific example. So my oldest son, uh, who graduated in 2012, took a variety of courses, Spanish all the way up through AP. He got nine hours credit at VMI and had a Spanish minor. My son, who graduated last year as valedictorian, uh, he as a sophomore, was told that he could not take AP at Lafayette, um, this was in Latin, that he would have to travel by bus to Jamestown and then take it online. As he pr proceeded through his courses, he realized that was logistically just not an option. And so he was with a hole uh, in his training. And as he went through college applications, the refrain from colleges at high levels was, you've got a hole in your language. He was competing with students from across Virginia and across the country who had stronger foundations in language and schools which had a stronger commitment. So as you look to where courses can be pulled, <clears throat> I suggest to you that they're like bricks. As you pull bricks out of a foundation, it may not immediately collapse, but over time it weakens. And as it weakens, 
our students are the ones who weaken in their competitiveness. So please consider that as you vote on the resolution for National Foreign Language Week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. John Atkins. Good evening. My name is John Adkins, and I'm the president of the Spanish Honor Society at Lafayette High School. I feel that it is my honor and my duty as both a student and as an advocate for human connection to express my disagreement with the provisions of the reforms concerning the World Languages Department. Preventing students from having the opportunity to pursue upper level language and cinema classes based on application numbers and diminishing the importance of world languages with revised graduation requirements are acts that are not only detrimental to the future success of students, but further exemplify the tendencies of the American public school system to favor statistics over depth and quality of education. Based on my understanding of this issue, it is evident that this division plans to offer these upper level classes online which would be a viable solution, except for the fact that a classroom setting is absolutely imperative for learning a foreign language. For in my experience, the true value of a language isn't limited to the basic skills accrued, but rather the interpersonal, multicultural connections that stem from human interaction. Languages allow us to empathize with one another, something that is greatly needed in our modern society. I can safely say that the interactions that I've shared with native Spanish speakers have been filled with humility and understanding. I can also say that I would not have achieved this level of connection with my fellow humans if it were not for the education I received in the classrooms of Lafayette High School. There are many children in this school division who are not exposed to foreign culture in their homes, and perhaps their only exposure to the various cultures of our world come in the form of our language classes. In this sense, it is crucial that our school division continues to provide that cultural exposure so as to instill empathy and understanding in the hearts and minds of all students. WJCC is a premier school division. And in order for it to maintain this status, I humbly implore this board to consider, or perhaps reconsider, its stance on its issue, so as to protect multicultural empathy and influence altruistic tendencies among all students. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. Jessica Poli. Good evening. My name is Jessica Poli, and I have been involved in the study and appreciation of the French language for six years. It has recently come to my attention that WJCC schools may lose higher language courses, such as French cinema, and I have now chosen to explain my concerns with this. Last year, I was given the privilege of taking the AP French course as well as French cinema, along with another group of students. These courses provided me with information about the language as well as the culture of both Fran France and other Francophi Francophone countries. Now I know that courses such as AP French will, be, will not be completely um, expunged for they will be taught online. However, it never occurred to me that my class could have possibly been the last AP French course taught in front of a real teacher. If cinema does not meet the minimum amount of students, then odds are that AP French will not either. Being in a truly interactive classroom allowed me to expand my knowledge of both the language and culture with the help of an incredibly passionate teacher. Without this interaction, I don't think that I would have continued the French language, let alone language in general. Removing higher, higher level language courses would discourage students from develop developing an appreciation for other cultures and interacting with others outside of the United States. Um, with a minimal amount of courses to take without using other forms of learning, studying a language becomes simply about the credits needed for graduation instead of a passion and interest in other cultures. In November, a large group of French students at my school, including myself, were given the opportunity to go to France. Without my high level of understanding of both the French language and culture, I would not have been able to interact with the people as well. These courses open doors to new opportunities for both students and the United States. It allows us to interact with people a lot easier, and comprehending other languages links numerous countries together. Um, you must understand that English is not the only language, and we must study these other languages in depth. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Foley. Isabel Garys. Hi, my name is Isabel Garys. I'm a senior at Lafayette High School, and I'm here to talk to you about the revision of the language program. 
Learning French has been one of the most important experiences of my whole life. It has allowed me to experience a new culture, expand my thinking, and open myself up to new possibilities not previously presented. I took French for a very specific reason, because it's my dream to one day live in France as an artist, a dream that is underway because I was admitted to JMU's art school and will be attending this fall, double majoring art history and French. This dream was something that I have chased my whole life, and being able to take French through the AP level has allowed me to take that dream into my reality. This is why it is so important to not cut our language departments, for the kids who care. For the kids who don't just see languages as a credit that brings them one step closer to graduation, but for the kids who take these classes to fulfill their passions. I realize that there will, be, that there will still be certain language classes available, and for those truly motiva motivated students, AP languages will be available online. But that is an insult to these students, to say they're not worthy of a real teacher, of some opportunities in others that other school districts get to enjoy, especially when we cut a class such as French cinema. If AP Physics or Biology or any other class was suddenly offered only online, it would disrespect those kids who have other dreams, such as becoming scientists or doctors. There would be outrage and pushback, which is why we are here to fight for what we are passionate about. Every student's passions and strengths are important, so I stand before you today to ask you to consider everything I have said and consider the other students in elementary and middle school who are developing dreams just like mine, and I ask you to, the, to allow them the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garys. And Ryan Garys. Good evening. My name is Anne Ryan Garys, and I'm a freshman at Lafayette High School. I'd first like to extend my regards to the school board for hosting us here tonight, and I'd like to echo the sentiments of my fellow peers. It is incredible. It takes a lot of bravery and a lot of passion to get up here in front of a school board and speak about a topic like this. That should really show to you just how passionate all of us are. When the news of the proposed cut hit my French classroom, I think that the word crushed may even put it a little bit too lightly. French cinema is a class that all of my fellow peers had looked forward to taking for a very long time. It was one of the reasons that they signed up for French in the first place. It was unfortunate to see. I have already started to notice some of my fellow students losing their motivation that they once had in French to do well. I think that if we do not cut French cinema, it may bring back some of the motivation that the students once had. While I am here to show to you what my other students are, what my fellow students are thinking, I am also here to tell you about my own personal experiences. In November, I was lucky enough to embark on a private trip to France. I had already had a passion for the French language, but in improper terms, I would say that this definitely sealed the deal for me. I had always thought that France was going to be someplace I'd love to visit, and I always thought that the French people were going to be amazing. I'd love to use my French skills to communicate to communicate with them, and this definitely just enhanced my thinking. I can already see, just as a French 3 student, my French skill is getting better and better by the day. Not only is this, I do not, I thank my teacher for doing this, and also the experience that I had in France. Something else I'm very passionate about outside of learning French is international relations. These two go hand in hand. Ever since seventh grade, a French class has been my favorite class to attend in the entire school day. I would always look forward to it because I was motivated by it. In other classes, I'm motivated by the grade. And sure, I may enjoy the curriculum, but in French, I'm motivated because I want to retain the information that I have learned. I want to use it in my job when I am older. And I think that with the French skills I've developed and will continue to develop, that will help. French cinema is something that will help this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garys. Michelle Lopez. Good evening, board members. My name is Michelle Lopez, and I am a junior at Lafayette High School. Knowing a second language is a viable tool to have in today's society. It's just one more skill you need to have in life. In Williamsburg alone, Spanish can be heard in grocery stores, work environments, and schools. Taking AP Spanish can make students stand out in college admission process, earn a college credit without the college price, and create a challenging course that can be beneficial in the future. Students who already took AP Spanish already finished the race and, succeed, and succeeded because of Senora Perisakis, who is the AP Spanish, at, Spanish teacher at Lafayette High School. I want to finish the race too. Learning a, learning a language online will serve no help. Instead, it, it can decrease motivation and the students will, would, have, would eventually would have learned nothing. Also, it will not help with real life scenarios like speaking to a native Spanish speaker or <coughs> communicate in a Spanish speaking country. 
Here in WJCC, we are equipped with the best language teachers that you guys, the board members, should be ex extremely proud of. In closure, I would like all of you to take in consideration my vote. Students like me are so close to the finish line, with the rewards of standing out in competitive colleges to saving thousands of dollars in course money. Michael Gove, who is a former British Secretary of the State of Education, once said, Learning a foreign language and a culture that goes with it is one of the most useful things we can do to broaden the empathy and imaginative, and imaginative sympathy and a cultural outlook of children. Thank you for letting me speak and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Carrie Collins. Good evening, Dr. Heron and members of the board. My name is Carrie Collins, and I'm the mother of uh, two students at uh, WJC School District, as well as the proud French teacher at Lafayette High School. Um, and I'm here tonight to talk to you about two specific points. Um, they have been made by some of my students and some uh, parents as well. This is my 15th successful year of teaching here at um, uh, the schools. I've taught at Berkeley Middle School. I've taught at Hornsby Middle School and Lafayette High School twice. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have um, to be a part of the World Language Department. We have a solid selection of language courses to our students, but these are in jeopardy. The first point I'd like to address is the situation of the middle school. The proposed plan of studies for the changes in the program of studies will take away um, the sixth grade um, world sampler program and the high school credit from seventh grade. The program um, was in place a few years ago, and it was not in the best interest for long-term student achievement. I've seen that over the the last 15 years. Studies have shown that the earlier that a student starts a language, the better the success of cognitive acquisition. Take a look at our neighboring school districts. Newport News begins language learning in a, once a week in most of the elementary schools. York County offers high school credit in the language selection from sixth through eighth grade, as well as the solid selection of upper level schools for Chinese and Arabic. As a parent, I want to know that my middle schooler that's going in next year um, to Berkeley Middle School will be able to try out all four languages in the wheel. That one of the reasons I personally moved from the north to this district, this primary district, was because of the fact that each of the middle schools and the high schools all offered four languages. Learning a language is vital for college-bound or non-college-bound students. Should my son choose to work here in Colonial Williamsburg, at Bush Gardens, or at a local restaurant, we know that he will come encounter with other people who speak other languages. And we owe it to our children to start this in the sixth grade. The other point I want you to vote on is the fact that uh, French cinema is an important part of our program of studies. Thank so you, Ms. Collins. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Kim Hundley or um, Emile Smucker? Emily. 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 Sorry. Good evening. Kim Hunley, president of the Education Association. And um, I have some of my exec here. And we just wanted to make sure that you all do feel appreciated every month. We hope you have felt the love. Um, what to do about the budget and money? Where can we get the money from? I mean, that's the big thing that's been every year that I come up here. And um, if I could, I'd rob a bank. And I've always wanted to go up and say, put the money in the bag. So <laughs> that's why you have bags with money tonight. And so you should have enough to um, cover everything you requested in the budget. Yes. And um, <coughs> so um, and I'm so proud of the young students. I just want to say, wee oui, wee. Oui, that's the only French I know. <laughs> but I'm so proud of y'all. Y'all did an awesome job. But um, again, we are here to support you. We're working, but we do know that Richmond is where all the decisions are made, and hopefully we'll get some good um, feedback from them. Um, thank you very much for your time. And cabinet members, we got to some of you, but not all of you, so first come, first serve. I have four left. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Humley. <coughs> Kenna Williams. Hi, my name is Kenna Williams, and I'm a senior from Tab High School. I'm here today as a member of Y Street. Y Street is the award-winning youth volunteer program of the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth that focuses on promoting healthy living in Virginia. You may remember me from your October school board meeting that I attended in hopes of opening a dialogue between your division and the 24-7 campaign. Tonight, I am here to congratulate you for the work that has been done 
with your division with your division's tobacco free policies to make them 100% comprehensive. I am so excited to see the changes that were made, such as extending the definition of property to include on and off site events, whether owned, leased, or chartered by the division. Updating your division of tobacco products to include alternative products like electronic smoking devices and other products containing nicotine. With these updates, you have shown a strong, consistent commitment to the health of your school community, and you will serve as an example to encourage other school divisions nearby to do the same. I am standing in front of you today to thank you. Thank you for putting the health and safety of your staff, students, and visitors first by doing everything you can to have 100% tobacco-free schools 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I am asking all of you to please vote yes to these important policy updates. Once you adopt a new policy making our schools 100% making your schools 100% comprehensive tobacco free, the 24/7 campaign has great ways to support implementing and enforcing your new policy. First, you will provide free tobacco free signage to all schools in our division. Sorry. <laughs> Second, our free tobacco and e-cigarette free schools toolkit will be sent to all schools in your division. Third, we will add you to the official map of 100% comprehensive divisions on our handout and website. Finally, we will work with your division to help earn positive publicity for updating the policies. On behalf of Y Street, thank you for listening to what the youth have to say, and I hope these policies will be passed tonight so that Williamsburg, James City County Public Schools will become the 35th division across the state with 100% comprehensive tobacco-free policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. She's taller here than she is in the county. The city. <laughs> Was that the last speaker card? Yes, that was the last speaker card. Thank you very much. So that brings us to the consent agenda. Item 7.01, approval of minutes from the January 2nd, 2018 meeting, the, the January 16th, uh, 2018 meeting, and the February 6th, 2018 meeting. 7.02, financial report and monthly bills and payroll from January 2018. 7.03, personnel actions as presented. 7.04 Resolution R-6-18 School Social Work Week, 7.05 R-7-18 National Foreign Language Week, 7.06 Revise Policy BD School Board Meetings, 7.07 .07, Revise and Rename Policy CBA Qualifications and Duties of Superintendent to Qualifications and Duties for the Superintendent. 7.08 Revised Policy KGB Public Conduct on School, school Property. 7.09 Revised Policy KCG slash GBECA Tobacco Use on School Property. And 7.10 Revised Policy IKF Graduation. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Can I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Ms. Thurza, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. <clears throat> Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda passes. That brings us to item 8.01, Equity Through Engagement, the Child Health Initiative. Um, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam yeah. Chair. It's my delight to introduce this evening another in our Equity Through Engagement series with the Child Health Initiative. A lot of the work we accomplish in the school division is due to the wonderful partnerships we have in our community, and we have some of those partners with us tonight for this presentation. Ms. Bourgeois is going to lead off this evening by introducing some of our partners and the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. This evening, on behalf of our core partners and the Office of Student Services, Janice Fowler, Supervisor of Health Services, and I will share information regarding a unique partnership which provides a collaborative and comprehensive approach to families and positively impacts student readiness to learn. The equity presentations given thus far have focused on initiatives directly within our schools. Tonight's presentation highlights a community-based initiative addressing risk factors which impact students and their families. Before beginning the presentation, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce members of that partnership that are here supporting us this evening. Please welcome for me, Jean Zeidler, President and Chief Executive Officer for the Williamsburg Health Foundation. Wave. Paul Scott, Executive Director for Child Development Resources. Lisa Thomas, Deputy Director for Child Development Resources. Rebecca Vinroot, Director of Social Services for James City County. Wendy Evans, Deputy Director of Social Work and Community Services for the City of Williamsburg. 
Gwen Kitson, the care team manager from the city of Williamsburg, and Bob Keller, a WJCC social worker. And this is just part of the team, so you can see what a group effort this is. We appreciate their attendance tonight as well as their ongoing support. During the 2014-15 school year, representatives from WJCC schools were invited by the Williamsburg Health Foundation to participate in a work group focused on children. This age group was initially the focus group, preschool children, as it was seen as a transitional time period between the services offered through child development resources and our school division. This work has been guided with strategic planning support from Dr. Stephen Horan with Community Health Solutions. His guidance ensured that the outcomes identified by the team were based on current researches and best practices. As we looked into the barriers to school attendance for our student population, it quickly became evident that these barriers were not always directly related to the child's personal health, but rather to any of a number of factors impacting the stability and health of the family. Our research led us to the strong belief that a comprehensive, multi-agency partnership that works to address barriers to access would provide the best opportunity to create a stable home environment for families and would better allow students to come to school ready to learn. The City of Williamsburg's Department of Human Services was invited by the Health Foundation to submit a grant request for piloting the initiative. Implementation began in July of 2015. From its inception, the City of Williamsburg, Child Development Resources, and WJCC schools have worked collaboratively to identify our most at-risk families and provide them with the tools to empower them to gain stability. A guiding tenet of the Child Health Initiative is a focus on the whole family. Research from Ascend at the Aspen Institute recognizes the concept of a two-generation continuum. With the whole family as the focus, supports and resources are developed from two perspectives. From the child-focused perspective, the core partners looked at areas which, with limited access or understanding, can impact the parent's ability to support their child's physical, emotional, and social development. This can include areas such as family literacy or generational educational neglect. From the parent-focused perspective, this can include elements such as child care assistance, access to stable housing, or reliable transportation. All of these elements become interrelated and ultimately impact a child's development and readiness for learning. We believe that education, economic assets, social capital, and health and well-being are the core components that create an intergenerational cycle of opportunity. Quality early education for children and post-secondary education for parents are central to approaches that move the whole family toward economic security. The focus is on networks and systems most able to influence the lives of our families. Within our community, one example of these networks are the programs which provide young children with opportunities for early childhood development. These resources include CDR, Head Start, Bright Beginnings, and community preschool programs and activities. The Child Health Initiative purpose was developed following many months of research and discussion, which led to the realization that in order to most effectively support our children, we must address the needs of the family with a priority on health and well-being by utilizing a multi-agency team approach. Dean Zeidler, the current president of the Williamsburg Health Foundation, has been a pivotal member of the team developing the organizational model for the Child Health Initiative. Ms. Zeidler, along with Lisa Thomas, the deputy director of CDR, <coughs> described for you the initiative's development. The Health Foundation uh, is really working to improve the health of people who live in our community. And we have this vision that every individual who lives here should have the opportunity to make good decisions for their own health. And so this initiative with children was to ensure that children have that opportunity as well. There's a lot of evidence that shows that um, poverty and uh, health outcomes are very related. 
And so the, some of the barriers that we see here are the barriers that are associated with poverty, poor nutrition, lack of sleep, a housing that's not stable, um, family situations that are uncertain, and the Child Health Initiative with connecting um, community supports with health resources kind of begins to address all of those together. The Williamsburg Health Foundation identified the Child Health Initiative as a way of addressing the need for home visiting support for families that were um, really struggling with some um, global issues that were affecting their child's health and development. The initiative really needed some strategic planning support to help the partners really identify what the critical components of the model would be and to really help us kind of talk through what, um, what our approach would be, um, what we already knew, what things we didn't know, how we would communicate it with our community partners, and then what our strategic direction would be. It's really um, valuable to have an outside third party who can um, help people think through the project as it's being developed. We recognize that for children and their families, needs are becoming more and more complex, and one agency cannot address all of them. One of the things that we know about child development um, and about education in particular is that children do best in an educational setting when their other needs are also being met. So we need to make sure that they have stable housing and they have access to nutritious food and they can go to the doctor and their parents have the supports that they need um, in improving their parenting skills. And if all of those things work well, then the child will be successful in school. So how did we begin? The implementation of the Child Health Initiative began as a pilot focused on the families living in the city of Williamsburg. The core partners established the goal seen here for the Child Health Initiative in order to focus on actively engaging the family and community agencies as partners. This collaborative approach provides services and supports based on specific family needs and goals. Child Health Initiative serves families who present with multiple risk factors and demonstrate a readiness to participate. These families can be referred for eligibility from any of the core partners. In WJCC, our school nurses, social workers, psychologists, and school counselors have been trained on the purpose and referral process. An eligibility team with representatives from each of the core partners meets monthly to review referrals and determine eligibility. Once a family is eligible, a member of the care team meets with the family to identify areas of need. The family then determines their goals that they want to achieve. The City of Williamsburg Department of Human Services has identified the staff members working in the Child Health Initiative as the care team. The team is comprised of three staff. The care team coordinator provides case management services to families, performs administrative duties, and oversees the day-to-day -day operation of the Child Health Initiative. The care team nurse guides and educates families to improve their connection to community health supports and services. The nurse also provides health education to the adults and children in the family, leading to a healthier lifestyle. The case manager assists with the coordination of support systems to the family and children to produce better health outcomes. The case manager assists families with needs assessments, monitoring, planning, and advocacy in order to obtain needed services and benefits. We know that health and well-being can be severely impacted for families who have multiple needs and challenges. A family-centered approach focuses on improving child health and well-being by strengthening the collaboration with local providers. Multiple agencies work together to engage families as partners to help them achieve both parent-centered goals and children's health goals, to help family members gain skills for a healthier lifestyle, and to help families navigate through various support systems, health and otherwise. Many of the goals are centered around stable housing, addressing mental health concerns, accessing community services and supports, and establishing a medical home, which means establishing a partnership between healthcare professionals and families to provide comprehensive and high quality primary care. In order to build on the unique strengths of each family, 
All families enrolled in the Child Health Initiative have a team that in addition to a primary case manager and nurse, may include school representatives, mental health providers, community agencies, and other service providers. Families have frequent contact with the care team, including home visits, regular team meetings, medical appointment navigation and accompaniment, health promotion and education, as well as ongoing monitoring of services. All families have the following standard health goals. Children's immunizations are up to date. A primary care provider is identified. Medical information and appointments are organized and readily accessible, and families choose six health education modules to complete. This video, in this video, care team members share perspectives on the Child Health Initiative and its powerful effects on care team families. The goals of the care team is to en enhance the, the health and well-being of, of the, the children. And one of the things that we know is that children cannot come to school and learn if they're hungry or if they're worried about where they're going to sleep tonight or if, if mom or dad has been out of work for one month, six months, and there's no money. So one of the things that we address is, is we, we look at those issues. We look at employment. We look at housing. We look at at the things that the family needs to, to sort of provide a stable home environment best we can so children are able to come to school and focus on the things that they need to focus on, which is learning. I really see the value in having the core partners working together on a regular basis as being able to share their expertise and even at the level of service delivery, each of the partners brings knowledge of that child and family from a much different perspective and when we actually sit and share what we know, it makes it so much easier to come up with solutions that work. Um, and from my perspective as a school social worker, uh, we have several families or families that have some high needs. And I'm able to contact um, and put a referral into the care team to say, these are some families or this is a family that is really struggling and needs some additional layers of support that uh, we at the school level are not able to address. The child is living in a motel or children are living in a motel. Multiple people, sleep can be an issue. Um, food and nutrition becomes an issue. There's just so many different um, factors that can impact that and I see the care team addressing those bit by bit. Through the grant from the Health Foundation, we have been able to fund several families for obtaining CNA license, CDL. We have assisted families with maintaining housing, or if there's a medical need and they may need some type of treatment that they are unable to afford, we have been able to accommodate their needs. I try to help people to um, care for their kids, uh, follow through on doctor's orders, get to appointments, and sometimes these appointments are far away. It might be Norfolk, it might be Richmond. And so I help with um, getting them there, helping them understand things, and to um, make them accountable to try to follow through what the doctor asks. So it gives them the confidence to do what needs to be done um, and empowers parents. To be able to have you know, eyesight that's corrected, um, that's just one example. Dental care, you know, or if they have asthma, a chronic condition where they need a medication, um, you can't think about math and reading when your teeth hurt or if you're having trouble taking a breath. And I think what we often say about the care team program is that, that in our world it takes a village to provide services for the program. And I believe that the, the power comes from the partners that have, have, have stepped to the table and, and creating this, this sort of ripple effect. The power of this initiative is that the core partners have developed this really cohesive and strong working relationship. And any time that you can develop relationships across agencies for the benefit of kids and families, then the community really comes out on top. With WJCC as a core partner of the Child Health Initiative, 
The impact on students' lives and readiness to learn has not gone unnoticed, as you can see by comments from school staff members. These data reflect the current work of the care team as well as their work to date. Since its inception, 48 families have been served, affecting the lives of 93 children. A care team family shared the following comment on the services provided by the care team. Quote, the communication with my case manager is great. There's a level of confidence my case manager has in me and my family. If there's something specific that my family needs, the urgency of a return phone call for the need is spectacular, as are the resources they provide. You can see that just in November of 2017, the care team provided a variety of services to families residing in the city of Williamsburg. And this is just a snapshot of the many services they provided. A care team participant satisfaction survey, one family shared, quote, the care team is dedicated to helping us organize our lives and lead healthier, more productive, and independent lives. In this video, our core team members and two of our families share the impact of the Child Health Initiative. <laughs> One example is a young man that we were working with. He was a teen dad who had a child with special needs and was struggling with housing and transportation and child care issues, as well as trying to make sure that his son was getting the special education services that he needed. And by bringing in the partners from the Child Health Initiative, we were able to address his housing issues, his transportation issues. He was studying uh, to become a medical technician, and so we were able to provide some support. And in the end, he was able to accomplish all of his goals. The care team has put us in a better place. They kept us from being homeless and also helped us get on track with our weight, with our goals, things we wanted to just do that we thought we couldn't do. Well, a lot of things we knew what we wanted to do, like I knew I wanted to get my license to kind of like contribute to the household, so I talked with the care manager and she got it all set up together for me, so got my license so I can help out with him, so took a lot of stress off of him and yes. helped with the family. And he also wanted to get his CDLs, and she told him things about how to get the program started, which made him want to go out and do it more. So he's decided to, you know, work for the school system, drive the bus. And my middle son, he has done a 360. He's, I got a call from the principal, and he's like, he is doing excellent. We appreciate everything they have done for our family. The care team stood beside me when I was sick, and it helped my family. Both of my boys were in the youth achievement program. And the care team also got a mentors and a tutor. One of the things that um, is so amazing about the Child Health Initiative is that it's so innovative and that it's so unique and that a small community like ours could come up with an approach that seems to be working so well and that could be replicated in other places. Our intention was always that um, when we have a program that it, that is working and appearing to work. We're looking for ways to scale it and spread it throughout our community so that all children and their families who are, need this can um, have access to it. It's working, that it's working for children and their families and uh, that is very promising long-term. With the ongoing support of the Williamsburg Health Foundation, planning stages have begun to expand and replicate this initiative. The core partnership now includes James City County Social Services and Old Town Medical Center. James City County Social Services will be submitting a grant to the Williamsburg Health Foundation next month for consideration to expand the Child Health Initiative to James City County residents. Thank you for this opportunity to share this unique and innovative partnership that is positively impacting the lives of our children and families. Stephanie and I are happy to field any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um, before I um, ask uh, my colleagues if they have any <coughs> questions or comments, just in the interest of full disclosure, I work on this project at, at the Health Foundation. So, um, Ron B., do you have any? I just wanted to ask, so when you begin to work with a family, 
how long do you provide support until and until they don't need it? Can they kind of come in and come until out they, based on need? Right. It, uh, it's based on goals, goal attainment, and then and then you know the hope is that they attain all their goals that they set for themselves and they can move on towards an independent, healthier lifestyle. And I know this project is new, but have you had an opportunity to to look at like success rates? So so families that you help provide support and then and then they, they don't need additional support. Like does that make sense? There are families that have reached all their goals and exited the program. So those are seen as, as our success stories. So yes. Thank you. It's a wonderful program. I, mean, I think this is a real important initiative and, and uh, real important for our community. The, the uh, kids, some lots of kids today come with so much baggage to school and, and uh, expecting them to learn when they have some of those, some of these, you know, basic Maslow needs. It's, it's really very, it's, it's a challenge and it's, uh, it's tough to ask the kids to do that. So I appreciate the, this, this program, this initiative and stepping in to help, help meet those needs. So thank you much. Mrs. Young? Yeah, I, I want to thank you very much for doing this because I especially like uh, the fact that, that you've provided a, a way for parents because parents are a huge, have, I mean, I, I've known very few parents who didn't feel that they needed to care for their children. But this idea of post-secondary and employment pathways, I think that's important because a lot of people struggle with getting ahead and the opportunity. It sounds like you're helping them find a way to, to move forward I think is excellent and I also like the idea that you're holding people accountable for their goals because I don't do very well unless somebody holds me accountable <laughs> so I appreciate that but thank you very much um, I did want to ask I mean um, I think Mrs. Ombi was referring to it but so far is, is the success rate um, I mean do you feel like I don't know how to quite I, I understand it's going to take a period of time but the success rate for where you are right now do you think that that it's, um, that it's working? Well, I would say the fact that we're trying to replicate this into James City County would, yeah. would say that for some of our families, it has worked very well. And, you know, if we, we meet the needs of one or two families, that's a success in my eyes. Yeah. Um, of course, we want all of our families to eventually meet their goals, but some families, you know, it could be three steps forward, two steps back as they work towards goal attainment. Thank you so much. I feel that way about dieting, so I understand. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm always um, amazed at the collaborate, uh, collaboration that is required uh, in order to solve some of these really complex issues that our, our students are facing. So thank you for, for working on that. My question is, um, what are our surrounding areas doing? Uh, is it something, is, is this truly unique in this area? This is truly unique. Um, the, um, the level of commitment and the level of collaboration and really looking at all aspects, especially for a school division to be involved in it, is very unique. We can't identify any place else for you. And I know it'll be a challenge to scale it because Williamsburg is 10% the size of James City County. And so I, I wish you great luck. And uh, I know it's going to be a challenge, but I think it's, like you said, if one or two families are positively affected, it's, it's great. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you all for your presentation. Thank you to all the partners for being here. I appreciate that. That brings us to 9.01 presentation of superintendent's proposed fiscal year 1920 operating budget. Um, first, I'd like to say that as a member of the school board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge I have an interest in the fiscal year 2018-2019 school budget because I'm an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe I'm able to participate in the, in, in the consideration of a vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Mr. Kelly. Madam Chair, as a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge I have an interest in the fiscal year 2018-19 school budget because my wife is an employee of the WJCC schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are delighted to present the superintendent's proposed budget this evening. This budget's proposal supports almost 12,000 students, including pre-K, 16 schools next year, and over 1,700 employees. 
Our schools are a vital, valued, integral part of the city of Williamsburg and James City County. And our funding partners, the city and county, have consistently invested in our schools, our teachers, and in our students, and we are very grateful for their ongoing support. Our reliance on county and city funding is due to WJCC schools only receiving about 25% of its funding from the state. Federal funding provides less than half, half a percent of the WJCC's annual operating revenue. This means that our funding partners continue to provide most of the funding to ensure a quality education is provided for all students in our schools. We really appreciate their support. The fiscal year 2018 proposed budget focuses on two key priorities, employee compensation and meeting the needs of all students, or equity. This budget proposal is informed by data. A full compensation analysis of administrative and support staff demonstrated that we are 3.6% below the market midpoint average in support staff and administrative salaries. Staff analysis of teacher pay in relation to nine neighboring school divisions shows we are currently second to last in entry year teacher salaries. Our most important resource in WJCC schools is people. I'm referring to the committed employees of WJCC schools. We sustain the excellence we expect and ensure each in student success by having great people, teachers, administrators, support employees, all of whom contribute to the positive environment that makes it possible for every student to learn. Providing fair compensation for all staff and especially our teachers who are at the heart of our mission is a priority in this budget. Therefore, this budget includes an investment of just under $3 million uh, in, our, in our valued employees to move us closer to the regional market average. It proposes a 3% pay raise for all, a step and an average of 1.5% for teachers and 3% for all others. If we are to attract and retain the best employees from teachers to bus drivers, we must compensate our employees fairly. This budget includes regrading bus drivers, custodial staff and cafeteria staff to a higher level on the support scale, increasing substitute bus driver pay and extending the contract at hours, hours of bus drivers. Of course, our number one priority is making sure every student has what he or she needs to be successful. Our student population is becoming more diverse, which is a very positive thing but it is imperative that we have the resources to meet the individual needs of all students. Therefore, this budget includes additional staff to support enrollment and demographics, demographics changes in our student body. In particular, staff have been added to meet the needs of special education students and English learners. And finally, there's an emphasis on providing access to innovative courses and early op college opportunities for all of our high school students. These are the overarching priorities, and it's my delight to, to ask Ms. Barnes, our Chief Financial Officer, to join me in presenting the details of the Superintendent's proposed budget this evening. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good evening, Madam Chair, other board members, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, let's see, this evening, though, we'll be presenting the Superintendent's fiscal year 2019 budget. And you've already seen a vast majority of the information that we'll show you this evening. But we've put together a concise presentation. And we'll discuss with you some of the division's issues that have driven the proposed budget. Okay, as we've discussed previously, this is simply a reminder that the state code section 21.1-92 requires that the superintendent, with the approval of the school board, to provide an estimate of the amount of money that's considered to be needed to support the public schools in the division. It also directs that the budget must be set up for each major classification or category that has been established by the Board of Education. This also reminds us that we need, we need to have examined costs and determine the proper needs to support the schools and the school division. State Code Section 15.2-2503 requires that on or before April 1st of each year, we must approve a budget of needs to pass on to our funding partners, both Williamsburg and James City County. So we're on schedule to enable us to deliver this budget by April the 1st. 
As we look back over the past 10 years, you can see that on September 30th, 2008, the division's enrollment was at 10,248 students and has grown by 1,229 students as of September 30th, 2017. We're expecting it to continue to grow by an additional 15 students. This is based on the FutureThink low projection. And the most likely projection from FutureThink shows the division growing by 129 students. But the low projection has been within 1% for the last six to seven years, and we use that number in financial budgeting because we don't want to overestimate our enrollment since much of the funding from our state is based on our student count. Also to mention, these enrollment numbers um, do not include our preschool children. Another area which we have experienced growth in, in is our student education, students, special education population. Um, over the last nine years, the population has grown by 213 students. And we've not only seen growth in the number of students, but also in the, their level of need. And the division is legally required to provide the services dictated by their IEP. Um, prior to this evening, you received a lot of information about <coughs> our special education students' needs and how we allocate teachers to students. So it would be helpful this evening to give you a sense of how we compare to the surrounding region in terms of how we resource this particular area. If you notice on this slide, um, our ratio is 1 to 16. It is higher than other systems in the area. Um, it's a complicated process because it each student's uh, disability equates to certain points, so it's not exactly student to teacher, but it does show that we are actually behind other systems in our numbers of education, special education teachers. That's why we're proposing some in the budget this evening. Also, you've received quite a bit of information about uh, English, English learners. And uh, Mr. Paul has brought lots of details and data about we how we calculate, how we support uh, English learners in our system. Just as a reminder, those are the numbers of students and their level of proficiency within our system. And tonight, we're proposing three additional English as a second language teachers to support our, our English uh, learners. The next slide provides, again, some regional comparison as to where we are in, in this. And if you notice, we're, we're second in line, 1, uh, 1 to 59 is right on standards of quality standards. Uh, York is a little bit beyond that. They actually have proposed three new teachers in their budget this year also. But everyone else actually has a number of aides in the classroom as well. So again, we're, we're making a step towards fully supporting an area of growth student growth, and also, also an area of great student need academically. So uh, we've, we've included those items that we feel are non-negotiable as they're items that the division would be required to pay. And we're expecting an increase <coughs> excuse me, in the tuition for New Horizons. And we're also anticipating additional expenses for the insurance, utilities, and custodial supplies at James Blair Middle School, as well as the additional staffing that will be needed. The VRS will, rates will be reduced for the next biennium by 0.67%, so that's an offsetting decrease. Thank you. To cover our enrollment projections, four teachers are included. Three are indicated by the enrollment projected, projection itself, and one as a reserve. We're also anticipating <coughs> an increase in the special ed services of 131,000. And lastly, we presented information relating to the safety of our students uh, regarding staff members overseeing metal detectors and the establishment of additional pre precautions and detection for de concussions. <clears throat> so under instruction, we've included that four additional special education teachers based on the expected rise of special education enrollment as well as a behavior intervention specialist. There are three additional ESL teachers to assist the needs of our English language learner population. One career counselor coach slash coordinator has been added to help our students meet the needs of the new graduation requirements. And we've included the expansion of the early college programs 
as well as the expansion in high school course offerings. <clears throat> Plus, we've incorporated the expected increases for the virtual learning program. <clears throat> We've incorporated the increase which would allow the division to expand the bus driver's weekly contracted hours from 30 to 35, as the average hours that are worked by our bus drivers is 35. And the cost for this is just the additional contribution to the driver's VRS, because we're already paying them for those hours. And an increase to the substitute driver pay by 50 cents an hour is also included, as well as two buses. And as we were able to purchase four buses with our end of the year uh, spending plan, we're hoping to do the same thing this year. This is the associated cost for an average 3% increase for all employees, as well as the regrade that the consultants discussed at the board's retreat, and, and Dr. Heron also discussed somewhat at, at her entry. Um, an entry level adjustment for our teachers is included, and this also includes the division's portion of FICA, and VRS. <clears throat> and this is just our first step to getting over the salary schedules and making them more competitive. So there were pro priorities that were presented to you that we've either eliminated, reevaluated, or we've determined ways of using existing available funding through the line item savings. Future Think has been within 1% of our enrollment for the last six years, so we don't feel that there's a need for the additional three FTEs um, that we had as reserve. Um, as we've purchased the four buses, as I mentioned earlier, with year-end spending, <clears throat> we hope to do the same thing with the end of this year, as well as to be able to purchase the bus lifts and the minivans. Uh, the above is from the DOE's published Table 15, and, which is a part of the annual report. And this will come out sometime in the spring, usually around April. As you can see, with the exception of three years, Williamsburg James City Schools has been below the state's average for per-pupil spending. Okay, looking at the history of our state funding, we're looking back to 2009, as we have in previous years, because this was the year that the recession made its in initial impact. So and until fiscal year 18, our funding was at a level that was less than that of 2009. And I know I've mentioned this before, but now the aggregate provides the appearance that the funding level has been restored. However, by breaking it out by rough uh, per pupil dollars, um, we're receiving $314 less per pupil than we were in 2009. So the revenues declined, but we're also faced with additional mandates that we didn't have in 2009. So Williamsburg, James City County has been very fortunate in that we've received increased enrollment, but otherwise we'd be looking at even less state revenue. Um, I think I've mentioned this to you before that I, I pulled um, the calculation tool that incorporates Governor McAuliffe's proposed budget. And rather than just looking at a rough estimate of $314 per student, I plugged in 10,249 students. And when I did this, it actually calculated that we would have just under $3 million less now than we would have in 2009. So this slide should also look very familiar. Uh, the funding uh, is based on what was presented by Governor McAuliffe's proposed budget. And the House and Senate have provided their, their versions, and they've exchanged their versions. In fact, uh, Dr. Heron and I were on a conference call today where they were, the DOE was explaining some of the, the issues. Uh, currently, the Senate and House versions, where one will add, the other will subtract. So they're, we're not sure where it's going to end up. Uh, it looks right now the, the only thing that might be affected is we're receiving some additional funding for special education regional tuition. So we'll see where that lands. And <clears throat> so I'm sure we'll end up with a hybrid of, of the two, or the, actually of the three. But currently we're looking at a potential increase of $1,065,848. <clears throat> This slide should also be very familiar to you. We expect that increase in the $1,065,848, and it's based on the published uh, 
James City County budget that's posted online, we're expecting a, an increase of our local appropriation by $5,613,703. Unfortunately, as we've mentioned before, we're going to experience a slight loss in our other revenue, and this is due to building rental um, going down, as well as we were being reimbursed by Thomas Nelson for our custodial staff, which now our custodial staff will be at James Blair. However, we won't have that, that additional revenue. Um, we're also going to see a slight reduction in the impact aid revenue. This, this is a slide just simply is, is a graph that provides a visual of our sources of revenue. You know, as you can see, we received 65.36% from our localities. Um, we received 24.64% from the state for the SOQ and the incentive areas and 9.5% of our budget is the state sales tax. Our other revenue is at half a percent, and that includes the federal revenue that is in the operating fund. This next graph just illustrates the operating expenditure by the Department of Education's established functions or categories. 73% of the budget, the proposed budget, is to be spent in instruction, 9% in operations and maintenance, 6% in both technology and transportation, and 3% in administration, and an additional 3% in attendance and health. This slide illustrates how the dollars are actually spent. 60% um, of the budget is spent on wages, 27% on benefits, 4% in purchased or contracted services, other charges such as professional development, and then materials and supplies. 1% of the budget is spent in tuition payments, and then less than 1% of the budget has been established for capital equipment and internal charges. And this is a summary of all of the items that we've included in the budget, uh, the non-negotiables. The total increase for an instruction at $1,010,708, and the salaries and benefits line, which would include the regrade, an average 3% raise for all, and an increase to the school board's health care contribution of 7%, allowing the employees to absorb their portion of the 7% increase. And this also includes a net budgetary impact for the increase of the division for health care because we did find some savings in those lines as well. And we've offset the expenditures through line item reductions after carefully reviewing the individual lines <clears throat> and comparing them to actuals. While we're exploring cost saving measures and plus we're looking at attrition savings. So we're able to find the $813,834. So this basically shows us that we have a balanced budget. Granted, we have an increase of that $7,330,385. However, with the offset of the reductions in attrition and savings, um, it leaves us with a balanced budget of six, an increase of $6,516,551. This next slide just shows you the total budget for all of our funds that will need to be approved um, prior to our submittal to the city and to the county. And the proposed grand total for, for all of our funds, excluding the capital improvement plan, which we've already approved, um, is $149,421,523, an increase of $7,499,876, which is a 5.3% increase. We could tell you that the child nutrition um, has leapt up 14.8% uh, because of the regrade for the um, f cafeteria food service workers, plus, um, you know, we've got that regrade, plus we do have the increase, their salary increases as well. And then we also have an additional school, so that shows the major impact on the child nutrition. So, there are just a few more steps or dates uh, to remember for our budget progression. We'll hold a public hearing on March the 6th uh, to entertain the citizens' opinions. Um, then we'll have another joint city and 
or we'll have another meeting, which is a joint city and county budget meeting on March the 16th. Then we will ask for your approval on March the 20th, depending on what you hear, of course, during the public comments. You may decide you want to use that as a, uh, another work session. And then if that being the case, then we would have the, we would ask you for your approval on March the 27th. And that would still keep us in line with our, our timeline to get the uh, budget to the city and county by April the 1st. And then hopefully uh, we'll know what the city and county funding will be and we'll be able to approve our budget on May the 15th. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Dr. Heron, do you have anything to add? I just want to thank Ms. Barnes uh, this evening. She's uh, been struggling with a cold and all kinds of other symptoms, so thankfully she was able to make it and get through this evening. Thank and you all. So I mean, thank you. For tolerating this. So before I um, uh, toss it to the, to the board, just a reminder that tonight is the presentation, and so we're not necessarily uh, expected to discuss it or ask questions. Um, we will have that opportunity um, in our both March meetings, the first March meeting is a work session, so we anticipate discussing this at length. If we're ready to adopt on the 20th, we will. If we're not, we have a, a tentative meeting on the 27th. So with that in mind, does anyone have any questions or comments at this point in time? Mr. Kelly? Um, having, having been through this cycle many times, it's good to see positive numbers there as far as revenue increases for... Uh, it is. Um, for our, for our school system, the, the, the one um, concern I have is is we we keep coming closer to SOQ numbers um, year over year. Uh, in particular, when you look at the slide that talks about uh, per pupil expenditures, um, where the state numbers are continuing to increase and we're continuing to be. You know, significantly below that. Uh, I, I do uh, appreciate the 3% uh, increase in for our uh, teachers and s teachers. Does that include substitute teachers? No, sir, it does not. So there's no change in the substitute teacher? Um, no, sir. Hourly no, rate. sir. Um, but it does change the bus drivers. Yes, sir. Substitute, substitute teachers, um, substitute bus drivers. Is there, um, I guess we've talked about other times about uh, how we can pay the support staff twice a month versus once a month. Right, and we're, we're going to look into what possible ways to accomplish this and, and not, um, not. Significantly. You know, right, not at a significant cost. Okay. And, uh, I just, I think that would be uh, um, something that we should, we should certainly explore for our uh, support staff. So, a um, couple of ideas. I'm okay. Good, um, but I thank you. Thank you for your good work and um, for you, uh, for you and your staff. And uh, hope you feel better. Thank so, you very much. And, and my staff much. has been wonderful. So, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, um, just this is just one quick question. What was the two? <laughs> $116,000 for high school course expansion. What is that? That was the project Lead the Way. Okay. And I'll be returning fine. to mm -hmm. talk about that. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Ms. Ombi. I appreciate the division's um, commitment to meeting the diverse needs of our students, but just want to note again that our demogra demographics continue to change, and so our students with disabilities and our English language learners those numbers continue to increase, and while we've we've made strides to <clears throat> to mitigate that, um, just want to just want to say again, um, it's not enough. So we need we need to continue to 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 move um, towards truly meeting the needs of of those students. But I appreciate all your hard work, sure. and I can relate to how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone on the panel yeah. has been through this. Ms. Young, hi. Yeah, I'm sorry you're not feeling well. <laughs> I I hope this isn't going to take too long. Um, but when we're talking about support staff, because one of the things that continues to come to us is that they would like to be paid twice a month. Yes, ma'am. And But how many people are we talking about when we talk about support staff, when we talk about uh, teachers' aides, cafeteria, all of the people that aren't teachers? How many people are we talking about? Well, I mean, all of the people who aren't teachers, but 
Um, no, but I support mean, custodians, staff means, uh, right. best drivers. That's what I would think. I would, I would assume two to three hundred. Okay. Just to build on what Mr. Kelly and Ms. Ownby said, um, you know, we have a bus replacement plan, and um, and oftentimes we're not able to keep up with it, but at least it's a it's a goal. Yes, ma'am. At some point, I would love to see something equivalent to that and thinking about, you know, as we, we're getting at, uh, something that gets us farther and farther away from SOQ rather than closer and closer to it, whether it's looking at our ELL population or our uh, SPED population or just um, – uh, our pay for um, for all of our staff members because this is a really good step in the right direction, but it's one year, and this is going to be a multi-year effort because eventually, if everybody else is making the same steps, mm -hmm. we're going to continue to be behind, and we need to be ahead because we want to retain the best of the best for our students. So I just at some point would love to look at this as a multi-year process. And I think we are looking at this as a multi-year process. I think we got good data from our analysis of compensation this year, and, and I do think this is a, it is a baby step in the right direction because others are giving some 2% and some 4% our proposed raises in different systems across our area. Uh, we were able, able only to to offer or ask for 1.5 percent last year, and I think we're we're really trying to catch up and at least stay where we are and catch up a little bit this year. But we can't stop doing this next year. Anything else before we take this up at the next work session? Okay. That brings us to our action items. Um, 10.01, award a contract for invitation for bid number 18-12033, Norwich Elementary School entry alterations. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move to award a contract for invitation for bid number 18-12033, Norwich Elementary School <coughs> entry alterations to David A. Nice Builders in the amount of $48,800. I have a second. Second. All right. Any discussion, questions? Mr. Snipes is ready, if anyone. All right, hearing no questions. <laughs> Ms. Thurza, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. That brings us to 10.02, award a contract for invitation for bid. Number 18-12032, DJ Montague Elementary School entry alterations. May I have a motion, please? <coughs> Madam Chair, I move that we um, uh, accept the action item award of contract for invitation for bid 18-12032, DJ Montague Elementary School entry alterations to AirTech Solutions in the amount of $42,000. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. All right, that motion passes. On to 10.03, request for a permanent right-of-way easement at Stonehouse Elementary School. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I, I make a motion that we approve resolution R-10-18 for the use of Department of Transportation right-of-way easement at Stonehouse Elementary School and, an, and maintenance agreement of the right-of-way. Thank you. Can I have a second, please? Second. All right. Any discussion, comment? Yeah. Yes. Um, so so uh, as I pause as Mr. Snipes makes his way to the podium. Um, so this is, uh, this resolution is basically for the, just for the public's information as they watch this tonight, is so that we can work in the right-of-way to build a bus loop canopy for the, is that what we're when it's Stonehouse. That is correct. We are building the bus loop canopy at uh, Stonehouse Elementary. The right-of-way gives us a zero setback for the use of that right-of-way, meaning right. that we can build closer to the roadway because the VDOT has given us a right-of-way to do so. They have allowed us to build in, into their, into their, their quote-unquote property. Into their own, that's yeah. And if you, go out and, if you go out and look at Stonehouse, you wouldn't know that this isn't our property. Correct. It is the bus loop. So most bus loops um, are on our property, 
Um, but in 2000, I believe that the bus loop, uh, schoolhouse lane, that bus loop was considered part of schoolhouse lane. Was there any thought of having this, the VDOT give us the property? Versus uh, that, us was not, that was not an immediate uh, discussion because of the need to have it done so quickly. Okay. But we can look into it. Yeah, as, as long as they don't want any money, I'll be happy to take the property from yeah. Because we because we cut it anyway, we we, we, we plow we it, and it, we, we do all that anyway. So we stripe it when we need to. It's just something we might look into is of having them give us that property back. So that's all. This is was in the CIP two or three two years ago. Two fiscal years year, ago, yes. Fiscal year sixteen CIP. A little bit delayed. Yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. With that, Ms. Sirs, will we call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. <laughs> Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. So the motion passes. That brings us to item 10.04-2018-2019 school calendar. Before I ask for a motion, I'm going to toss it to Dr. Heron and staff for a few remarks first. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we did have some questions last time about whether high school teachers would be attending when students were on schedule pickup and yes high school teachers will be in attendance from from four to six during that time to answer questions to meet students to give out information and i wanted to clarify that plus we have added a formal back to school night as well that was not on the calendar for high school last year or middle school and so they're now having that formal night when students can walk around and meet the teachers and get all of the information. That's purposefully placed after the add drop period so that students aren't meeting teachers that they won't have in the next year. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and ask for a motion and then we can hear from Ms. Overcamp-Smith on the feedback that you've gotten on the survey. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. All right, may I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move adoption of the 2018-19 school calendar. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, go to staff first and then go to questions and comments. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron, we did have um, an opportunity for our community to provide us with feedback. We received 69 responses. The bulk were from staff, 49 from staff, 19 from parent and guardian, and one student. Um, the responses were um, as typical, uh, the length of our break at winter, uh, professional development and work days, those were a lot of the staff concerns, makeup days and the days that were designated and teachers losing work days um, because they are designated as makeup days, and then the open house back to school night issue for high school. That was the bulk of the calendar feedback. Um, just to update you, the uh, pre-opening before, pre-Labor Day opening is not going to be an option for us for this 18-19 school year. It did pass the House. It did not pass the Senate. They delayed it for a year, basically tabled it. Um, we, do not, uh, we do not qualify for the waiver, so we will not be able to open before Labor Day in 18-19. Are there any questions? Ms. Overcamp Smith. Ms. Yeah, so yeah. What are the uh, requirements to get a waiver? I think you've talked about that before, <laughs> but what are the yes. requirements? You either are surrounded by school divisions that open before Labor Day, or you have a significant number of um, inclement weather days, school closures um, over a course of many years. Anything else? I want. To, I think. I, I think, as I understand, as I remember it, it's eight days over an average of eight days over five years, the preceding five years to get the right. to get the waiver. Five years in a row. I have kind of yeah, and, <laughs> uh, and we're at seven right now, so we're not we're not even there this year. Yeah. And we and, don't uh, want to be there. And we don't want to be there, and but I do know that I have I have no I have heard that some schools will call a snow day just to make sure they get their eight, but that's not that's. I know story. nothing about that. Right. Um, so the, uh, the high school schedule pickup on the 28th of August versus the open house for middle schools on the 29th, what is the difference in those two? Nobody's coming to get you. <laughs> to be determined, Mr. Kelly. Okay, so, so are they gonna be relatively, uh, Mr. Carroll seem, Dr. Carroll seems yeah. to be kind of moving at the moment. Thank you. 
Based on the feedback we've received, we'll just uh, continue to have our high school teachers flex their schedule and be available uh, in their classrooms, <coughs> excuse me, from four to six, as they traditionally have on the uh, schedule pickup night. But there okay. is no, there, at high school there has been no formal teacher, you know, the expectation has just been teachers are available in their classroom. Um, okay, because the concern I've had is that we have limited opportunity for our families and students to engage with our high school teachers. And so to take away a day was a little bit concerning to me, uh, an opportunity to do that, even though we did add the back to school night, but back to school nights are there for middle school and elementary as well, so. At high school, they will be available, but just please note that uh, more and more of our families are just getting their schedule through view and um, still a majority of our schedules are not picked up until the first day of school for our high school students because yeah, I mean I, I mean I get that my my senior in high school a bit of whore if I came to the to do that to pick up her schedule right but it, I think it's still it's still even though it's not a opportunity that a lot of students take it's an opportunity available for some students or a few students who take advantage of that and, and I think that's an available. important thing to to still to still give them that opportunity else and I appreciate that teachers will be available because um, even though the schedule is readily available on view and that may not be a reason to go to a high school in, in August to visit uh, finding out what um, what students need for the first day of school is something that's not always posted on view Correct. and so sometimes you have to go to the teacher and and get that information so that your student can be prepared and um, you know and also um, you know, a lot of parents, not, not only do they buy those supplies for their children, but they buy extra for others who may not be able to. And so having that advanced ability to do that is, is helpful. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Anything else? So it's been uh, moved and seconded to adopt the 2018-2019 school calendar. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Motion passes. That brings us to 10.05 annual review of school board operating procedures. May I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the um, school board standard operating procedures. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. I have a second? Second. Great. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Thank you. The um, SOP passes, and thanks to the policy committee for their work on that and for the feedback by all members of this board. It's a document that keeps us functioning well as a board. Um, 10.06, Program of Studies 2018-2019. Again, before I ask for a motion, I'd like to um, ask Dr. Heron if she has anything she'd like to add. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you're aware, we've had lots of really good feedback on, on the program of studies. I want to thank the teachers and students who made the effort to come this evening as well. Um, what I'd like to, with your permission, is ask Dr. Carroll to talk a little bit about the recommendations that were made in the program of studies with regard to world languages and some of the things that drove the initial proposal to you. And also he's going to provide um, some potential changes to slow down some of the changes that we were planning to make to give us another year to get further input on the decision. I think we, we lose our way when we don't listen when, when people speak to us and I think there's an opportunity to make some changes in what we're doing that will, will really help us. Provided just a, a quick summary of some of the information that, that Dr. Carroll has put together so that you have something in writing going away tonight. Um, but um, Dr. Carroll, just go ahead and just give us a yeah. sense of how we got here and some of the thinking behind it, and then we'll have questions from the board. Again, many of those uh, recommendations in the program of studies presentation uh, two weeks ago were database um, 
as we look at the uh, the high school cinema courses, for example, um, those have uh, not run at most of the schools for the last four years. You have those uh, the data there. Part of the issue that we're concerned about, especially uh, this school year with the compressed timeline of course registration and selection uh, due to redistricting, um, every time a student selects a course that ends up not running, even though it's offered in the POS for whatever reason, that's another meeting another choice, the counselor has to go back and meet with that student and that family and have those conversations all over again. And then one of the challenges becomes, are options available for that student that may or may not have been there if they had made a different first selection? So we're trying to be cognizant that the courses that are in our program of studies are have a good chance of running if students select that. that we don't have students signing up for courses that really, historically speaking, don't have, you know, have not typically run. Uh, so that's uh, one of the reasons behind that recommendation. Uh, and cinema also, uh, it runs, uh, it's the equivalent with um, conversation, the courses. So it's a, uh, the prerequisite is a, a level four. Uh, it's not a requirement. Uh, there's some misinformation about it coming after advanced placement. It's a, a course that can be uh, either prior to advanced placement or uh, at times when it has run, it's uh, run uh, co coincides with the advanced placement. I would just add to that, generally speaking, when we have a course that doesn't make for several years because it doesn't have students vote with their feet on these things, we do remove it from the program of studies. It's not something that sits there for eternity. And so the original uh, discussion uh, and, and proposal to you was based on the data that you have in front of you this evening. And then also, f I was gonna to switch to middle school, so if you have a high school and question. So, so the table that you have here, Madam Chair, I apologize. The table you have here, is this the students that signed up for those courses? Yes, that's for the entire division. So in 1617, you had 14 for French cinema, did, so that course didn't run? As far as I know, so I've, we've heard otherwise this evening, then I'll need to go back and research. Because the kids looked awful old. I, I, I know, so I'm not going to question the students. Uh, right. So obviously it did, and again, we've got an issue to look at with our data. Okay, all right, so. thank you. I think moving forward, um, we're offering a lot of courses next year, uh, innovation courses at the high school, and they won't all make. Students will vote with their feet if they choose to take a certain course. I don't think we're against keeping this in for one more year uh, to see the student interest in it and make sure that we've got our, our data right as well, even though it looks like it has not been high on the student list of options in recent years. I also have provided you some uh, information just historically the changes that the middle school world language program has gone through in the last few years and also middle school world language uh, staffing. And so those changes in the staffing and also uh, portrait of Virginia graduate and our challenge of uh, opening uh, Blair Middle School. Uh, those were all factors uh, into the decision, the recommendations that were made uh, with the POS two weeks ago. Uh, but however, as Dr. Heron said, based on uh, the feedback that we have from teachers, families, and the community in the last two weeks, uh, we'd like to amend that recommendation to leave the world language offerings, both at high school and uh, middle school, as they currently are in the 1718 POS. I think leading out of this, um, Dr. Carroll already had proposed to set up a, a task force to look at length and comprehensively at our language offerings across the grade levels, and I think that will take place as a result probably of this discussion, which is a, a good thing. So before, is there anything else that, 
Anything else you'd like to add at this time before we go to a motion and discussion? Not unless you have questions specifically for Dr. Carroll. Um, related to language? Well, let's let's get a motion before. So, but if I understand what staff is proposing, let me reflect back to you. Um, you're proposing that it's the program of study that you've presented to us with the exception of keeping everything in modern language um, the same as it currently is for now. Correct. And I do think there'll be some challenges with that. I don't know if, Dr. Carroll, you can speak to some of those in terms of staffing or... We'll just work through them and, and make it happen until we come back with a, a comprehensive solution. Um, let, let's get a motion, see if we can get a motion for that, and then we can ask some, the questions related to that. Is that okay? Can I, can I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the program of studies for 2018-19. As, 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 as modified by staff? Yes. Yes. Can I have a second? Second. Right. Excuse me, as modified by staff. In, you mean in terms of the proposed, the new proposal that's been submitted? So keeping. We would follow. Yeah, we're not. It's not the language that's in the new proposal. That's what you're. When you say staff, would you? Um, basically, the Dr. Bears were proposing that we don't make any changes for next year. That we take a year to fully explore the impact on students because ultimately it's the students that are th that we want to serve best in this whole scenario and because of the feedback we've got we really want to take a step back and look at it comprehensively get more understanding of it before we make any major changes in the system so the, the, the motion that's on the table right now right. is dr heron's recommendation which is no change to world okay. language okay but but all the other so, Modification. Yeah. so the approval of the program of studies is presented with the exception of maintaining the changes to the world languages. Sir, is there, are you good with that? Yes. Okay. So that's been, uh, that motion's been made and seconded. So with that, can we have some discussion? Dr. Beers? Aye. <laughs> what, I'm sorry. what did you ask me? Discussion. discussion. Oh, discussion. Yeah, okay, yeah. I say I would <laughs> okay. Sir, it, yeah. Um, Not me. No, I, 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 I want to ask some questions, but I, it's not directly related to this motion, so I, I have nothing else to say. Um, Mr. Kelly, do you have anything? To uh, well, the first thing I want to say is that um, in the time I've been on the board, this is the first time we've had more student speakers than, I, than, than adults, and so I really appreciate that, and I think that's a, that's a great thing, um, and it's a great thing that they're, that they're engaged in this because I don't know that we've ever had a whole lot of discussion about the program of studies and the, as it as it's come through um, so so I would I would um, encourage to look relook at our data as far as the French cinema and what has what has gone and so so um, moving forward after this we're going to kind of take another comprehensive look at our world languages and maybe world move a little slower to understand what our changes are going to be Yes, and uh, and also just uh, as I said, to Dr. Heron earlier today, we have to. I'll sound like a broken record, but remember that the context has changed. Profile of a Virginia graduate changes right. that that context of what we're looking at. So, uh, even when there are times that we want to go slow, there are things that are in the new POS that's been proposed that I, I wish we had more time on, but right. yeah, they sure. have to be implemented because that's what now is the expectation from the State Board of Education. Right. Right. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Chair, so just to build on what Mr. Kelly said, um, as we look at modern languages, I hope that we're able to include the stakeholders so every, everyone has a clear understanding of, of, of required changes and, and the reasons why we're aligning with the, with the state recommended changes, so just to in include people in the process. And then I have a t switch gears to something different. Wanted clarification on Project Lead the Way. So it was my understanding that as we look at um, innovative learning and and blended courses, that that we would th that those courses would take place across three high schools, not necessarily a program. So is the the program Project Lead the Way going to be at three high schools, 
or just the courses that were developed under that model at Warhill? I, Project, Lead, Project the Lead the Way is not a program. It's a, it's a, uh, bear with me. I, the way I explain it to people, if you're f familiar with the college board, um, Project Lead the Way is a national nonprofit organization that has developed, that focused on STEM education. They've developed curriculum and teacher training around that curriculum. So it's a set of curriculum. You're, we're adopting courses. It helps guarantee a, a certain uh, quality and expectation to that, um, those courses and the outcomes that we hope to have. <coughs> So maybe in the program, I think that's confusing in the program of studies. And I, I know Ms. Hummel and I've talked about it, so I, she has questions as well. But I, I, I will defer to, to Ms. Hummel. But I, I think that that's confusing in having those four little letters on the POS next to certain courses. It's a, well, it's a course. You can have just one Project Lead the Way course. And so each teacher, a teacher gets their certification from Project Lead the Way by course. So they. So then I do have a specific. Well, I'm going to defer to Ms. Hummel. Ms. Hummel. Okay. So in the budget, we have going back, we've got expansion of high school courses related to Project Lead the Way. And could you, first of all, explain what? the $216,000 is going towards in expanding Project Lead the Way? That would be for curriculum and, and materials at uh, Lafayette Jamestown, um, depending on the courses that are uh, selected and started. I'm sorry, could you, so So if you take, for example, biomedical science, that biomedical. particular course, there's a, bio, there's a, a lot of materials that are very specific that's needed for that course that are expensive okay. to enable it to function in another school. Each classroom needs the actual materials to run the course. So are you going to ex uh, purchase all of that material or are you going to wait until you see what the, the enrollment numbers are? We'll follow enrollment. We'll follow enrollment, and we'll know that in time to purchase the materials. Um, so the certification that's required to teach in Project Lead the Way, um, right now we have how many teachers that are certified to teach Project Lead the Way courses? Six or seven? Six or seven. And what does it take for a teacher to become certified? Uh, it's a uh, one to two week uh, training. And how do they get that training? Uh, they go to a Project Lead the Way uh, site. Uh, it's usually a summer training uh, hold in, held in conjunction with a, a partner university uh, for about 10 days. So are we going to be... Um, Certifying or are the teachers that are currently certified to teach Project Lead the Way, is that enough certified teachers to no? Depends on the, the program. We have three in engineering, one in computer science, and uh, two or three in biomed. Okay, so help me with the timing here. We're going to be offering this in the fall. And so the only way teachers could get certified is over the summer. So are there plans for this teacher certification to occur in the summer? That's when all the Project Lead the Way training occurs. Yes. I mean, it, yeah. So that, so those, that's already cleared with or communicated with the CTE, whoever is teaching these classes. Because nothing has been, a, been approved, so. But it's in the works. It's part of, there's a, I, in there's that, a recruitment. that certification is going to be paid for by the school division? I think that's but, part of the money in the budget. And the so money? if the program's approved tonight, we'll start immediately recruiting yeah. teachers in each of the schools to teach the courses and then set them up for, for summer training to be certified to teach the class in the fall. There's a process involved, and the first piece of it is 
approving it through this step first before we start to recruit teachers to, to do that. And then there's one teacher at Warhill. Is he the lead project lead the way teacher? Um, Achenbach? Yes. Mr. Achenbach, I presume. What is his role versus all the other five or six other teachers that are certified <coughs> to teach project lead the way? Like what's the difference between his role and the his other role teachers? With project lead the way or his mm -hmm. role with it, Williamsburg James is City he County. like a coordinator of project lead the way how does it work at he's actually he's a, a master teacher by project lead the way and has okay. five certifications so he's a master I'm just trying to yeah. this is just general information for everyone out there because this is going to be a new program and I just think the more people understand all of the details of the program it might encourage people to sign up for it. What worries me is if people aren't aware of it, they just see acronyms like PTLW and they don't know what it stands for, um, that I, I think it would behoove everyone to really do um, a really good job at educating the community and, and future students about what in, what is PT. LW because that acronym is is confusing for people so that would be one of my recommendations I believe there's going to be um, information at the student night that will there'll be a table where students can go and visit and pick up information about current <coughs> offerings and what's going to be offered next year and I would imagine some of the teachers will will be there or counselors certainly and teachers and and I'm still have a bunch of questions about this so um, so for the the staff that's going to be teaching in this program have they been um, have they been consulted like the world language teachers um, in a, a, as far as how this change is going to be affected at informal conversations but again I'm waiting for Board approval before we would move forward with anything. Okay, so informal conversations, but then we're voting tonight on a program of, of studies that they will have to adhere to. So I think that that's another just making sure that we're doing our due diligence um, when we, and I feel frustrated that the program of studies um, that we don't have the luxury because of the timing that we're dealing with. We don't have the luxury to bring up um, issues and then all of a sudden we have, to, we have no time and we have to vote on a program that there might be just questions about. I think it was great that the language teachers saw some issues and were able to generate a, a, a lot of um, support to come and talk about issues and things actually changed as a result and I'm, I'm thinking there might be uh, the area of CTE and Project Lead the Way is something that is huge and it needs a lot of discussion and, and thoughtful um, getting all the stakeholders involved which um, our teachers and our, and our students um, but I do have a couple more um, questions so if you will accommodate me uh, in the uh, program of studies proposal, uh, the one, it's the program of studies revision. It says that there is an engineering exploration class that's going to be combined with a introduction to engineering design, in parentheses PLTW. Uh, but when you actually look at the program of studies, uh, the red line version, that uh, engineering exploration course has been deleted from the catalog and uh, it, it is almost more like a replacement than a combination and the engineering exploration um, is only for grades I believe 9th and 10th whereas I'm sorry the introduction was 9 and 10 whereas engineering exploration uh, exploration was for 9th through 12th graders Should be it's a it's a replacement for IED would be a replacement for for EE, but it's not a replacement. I mean, you've got 
the replacement, you're, you're taking away an option for juniors and seniors to take that class. Check on that. We've had juniors and seniors take that before, so. You, oh, okay, I'm just looking at the program of studies okay. on page 79. It says um, only available for ninth and 10th graders. So if you could look into that. Um, and the other, the other issue is um, if engineering exploration is removed from the program of studies, will every high school be equipped to offer an introduction to engineering design through Project Lead the Way um, if the numbers don't, if there aren't enough, if you don't have certified teachers, because they didn't have an opportunity over the summer to get certified. And there's not enough exposure to what Project Lead the Way is in these courses, and you don't have the number of people that sign up for them. Are you, in effect, uh, instead of expanding the CTE options, for, for example, at Lafayette High School, are you perhaps setting up a situation where students that were able to take a class can no longer take a class because the class that it was substituted for didn't make because there weren't enough students that would sign up for it. And that, to me, is doing a disservice to some of the students that are currently taking that class. So, Mrs. Holman, I'm trying to understand the, the intro. You feel one class is going away is that the introduction to engineering that was run as, it was a pilot this year? Is that? No, intro, introduction to engineering design has been running for many years at Warhill. At Warhill, okay. But it's not, is that not offered at Jamestown and Lafayette? No, it is not. No, it's not offered at those two schools. What, what worries me um, is that there is an engineering exploration that's currently been offered for many years at Lafayette, and I'm worried that it's gonna be replaced with a, uh, a course that it's gonna, that there might not be a certified teacher to teach. And, um, and then it'll be, oh, this isn't offered, so you can take it at War Hill. And all of a sudden, instead of an expansion of CTE, we're actually looking at what could be a uh, lessening of options for students. And, that's a concern to me. Oh. Still have another question? Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. No, that's all right for right now. That's all right. Okay, I'll just, I just want to question, have a question about uh, the stakeholders. I mean, it's obvious that we have to let students know what this is, but also teachers. And is that voluntary if a teacher wants mm -hmm to do Project Lead the Way, is, is that a voluntary option? They're not forced to do that. Okay, because, I mean, to me, that would be really hard if I wasn't interested in something. And if you had me teaching engineering, you wouldn't want that. So you want somebody who has a passion about it. So, okay, that's kind of my question. Well, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Did you have anything else? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned that we are, um, in our, our rush to approve the program tonight, which I'm as assuming we have to approve the program tonight because we do. otherwise uh, we don't have a program of studies for our students to sign up for, I just would put my faith, I guess, in the administration to, to, to look at how this works and to maybe um, just research it a little more and make sure that we are not uh, adversely impacting in our efforts to to bring equity across all three high schools that we aren't in some uh, unintended consequence instead negatively impacting the choices that are available. True. I mean, I do believe by opening the doors and trying to offer as much as possible in reality, not every course will make in every school. That, that's a reality. The idea by opening the options is to let it build slowly, to 
to where we want it to be, where every student has access to whatever course courses they hope to take. Um, we won't know until we push open the doors and try. We offer AP classes in many, many subjects. Some don't make, some have fewer students than others, um, but students do follow their passion. And it won't all be in Project Lead the Way. That will be a very you know, definite group of students who go that direction. And I would also just caution us when we, um, following our uh, decision not to move 100 students from Jamestown to Lafayette, that um, when we talk about courses making or not making, that perhaps we look at, uh, rather than just a, uh, a number cap, we look at a percentage of available students who could take, I don't some kind of um, equitable situation so that students from smaller schools are not uh, put at a disadvantage just because they are going to a school that has less children. Zombie. Two comments. Not to belabor um, Mrs. Hummel's <coughs> points, but just wanted to make it clear, I guess our concern is that in, in, in creating potential options, it looks like we're going to eliminate something that has been, has been a longstanding course. And so if we do that, and the new shiny course, Project Lead the Way, doesn't make, then students who had had an older option would no longer have that. <coughs> so I guess as, as we move forward with new something new, Kate, to eliminate the old, and, and unless for schools like Lafayette, um, there would be a different kind of cap or something to play for that. That's change the subject, switch gears totally to talk about the curriculum fairs. So, will that format include a question and answer for, for families who are confused <coughs> and don't know what PLTW means, or will it just be information given to them and not back and forth? Ms. Parker has information about the upcoming fair for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, the curriculum fair and course planning night is both happening at the same time, so families have an option. The curriculum fair will run throughout, and there are actually, for the high school, 26 different um, content areas that will be represented. And so families who do have questions specific to Project Lead the Way can go directly to the CTE and the teachers and the coordinator there and ask those questions. Um, in conjunction with that, there'll be two separate sessions that is more information giving. So it's really both. It's information giving for Rising 9th specifically, and then another session for Rising 10th through 12th. Um, and then throughout the entire time, the curriculum fair will be going on so that all families and students can then ask more personalized questions. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Anything else? So, so following curriculum night, when do the students actually, when do you know whether you've got certain courses that are going to make or not make? So our course request process starts um, almost immediately following curriculum night. Um, it's a long process. Um, it involves our counselors having one-on-one -on -one meetings with students and families, as well as going through classrooms, because we do do course requests online. And so with this year, the timeline was condensed a bit. Um, and so we also added another feature where course requests will be sent home as well to give families one more additional time to look and see what their students selected, as well as look online. So we want to be... Um, really sure that families have an option to, again, look, look again, look again, um, so that our course request totals we pull uh, will be more accurate. And once the totals are pulled, um, which right now is set to happen in June, um, because of the pushed back and condensed timeline, once those are pulled is really when we start talking more about staffing and what courses will run, and that's when we get into the master schedule process. So really, in the master scheduling process, um, is when those decisions get made, and that's based strictly on staffing and course requests. Well, then I guess my recommendation would be for the classes that are going to be replaced with Project Lead the Way, that the lead teachers, the teachers for those classes, that our school division is making arrangements to have them certified over the summer so that we're not put in a position that, uh, oh, okay, the course made, now we don't have someone certified. Or all of a sudden, okay. you who's, you, you've taught this class for a long time, you can't, take it any, you can't teach it anymore because you're not certified. And there's no way you can get certified because the summer's already gone and we're starting class. So I would just say that that would be a caveat and something that would be helpful to think about. 
just to make it clear, Dr. Carroll, you did say that that, that process is a two-week process in the summer for Project Lead the Way certification. I, I guess I have a, 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 I've, I've got a question that Mrs. Hummels brought something up. Um, teachers getting certified over the summer, what are they being certified for? And how do you get certified just over the summer? Project Lead the Way has by a, what? Project Lead the Way certifies teachers on an individual by course by course that they offer. And isn't there an hour component though, in, in terms of working with a master teacher, that sort of thing? You're talking about an alternative certification it's approach, there. right? Not not the traditional one is. Where you, it's not a where, where teaching you sign license, up and it's through project, hour right? It's through Project Lead the Way. I'm just, uh, um, uh, and they're able to do that, they're able to jam all that stuff in in the summer. Yes, we've had teachers do that. Now, is that after they have done sort of field work with a master teacher the year before, prior to that? Oh, there's, uh, oh, um, yeah, yeah I, I guess um, I'm not understanding. This doesn't sound like the, the typical kind of alternative program, so I'm just curious. Dr. Beers, do when, Dr. Beers so, yeah. when the um, Project Lead the Way was launched at Warhill, there was a very, uh, there was a recruitment for teachers. There was discussion about what it would look like, and, and teachers were very, eager to be involved in teaching the classes because it was a natural progression of where they were as a teacher. And I believe that, Dr. Carroll, you obviously lived Warhill, I didn't, um, but teachers were, did the two-week course over the summer and were prepared to teach the course in, in the fall. It's not all new content, I think it's an approach to, uh, using a lot of the content that they know already. Is that a fair assessment? Sure. or? on the course, yes. And the state approves that certification? It, it's, not a, it's not a state certification. It's, I'm sorry, it's not a what? It's not a state certification. So what are they certifying? I mean, the state it, it creates a, the certification requirements for, you know, whatever the category might be. So I'm, I, that's why, I, I, you know, I spent most of my life dealing with that, so I'm just curious how that, if it's not a state certification, what is it, a local certification for it's, it's through, teachers in your school district? It's through Project Lead the Way, which is a national nonprofit organization. If and the state approves that? They're allowed to do that? No. No, Project Lead the Way gives them that certification. They get a certificate from Project Lead the Way to be able to teach that course that they completed the training for. They uh, cannot well, teach that class if they're not certified. So in our program of studies for intro to en engineering, if they do not have a Project Lead the Way certification, they cannot teach the class? They can be working on the certification and teach mm -hmm. it also. They can be working on the certification and teach it also. So if I wanted to teach Spanish, I do something during the summer with them and, and then I can teach Spanish? And Project Lead the Way is on the Spanish. What? Spanish is not a part of Project Lead the Way. Project Lead the Way. Oh, okay. It's very specific STEM-related courses, very oh. specific. If I could compare it to the IB program at James River, there's required So it's training. not necessarily it's out not of your discipline. Okay. That's, it was a, I, I just needed some clarification there. And, and I just want to make sure that, that we are protecting our teachers to the extent that if, if a certification is needed, that we are paying for it and making sure that there's time for them to take it and that I, I just am making sure that we are. And we know it works and you know there's data or whatever that people yeah, I, will go through this nonprofit thing. I think the only reason we're, we're trying to offer this at other schools is because there's been a huge interest from Jamestown and Lafayette because it's not offered there. So this is our attempt to try to offer the same opportunities to students across our system. We can't offer it unless we recruit teachers to become trained through Project Lead the Way because they hold 
the ownership of the courses and the badge for the courses that are that are recognized nationally. And who does the training? <coughs> Sorry? Training. Who does the training? I'm sorry. The, the who does the training? The certifications done through uh, project master the teachers or project lead the way. I'm sorry. The what? The training is done by project lead the way, the national nonprofit organization. Okay, and is this online or do they come here in the summer or? No, they they travel to different locations to receive that training. Okay. We, we can certainly provide the board some information about the process and the courses and make sure you have some detailed information about it. That would be helpful, right. Okay, anything else about the program of studies? I have a question. Hey, Dr. Carroll, I, I noticed on page 21 is starting to talk about uh, the introduction to career exploration for the middle school. <coughs> and it gives a description here of uh, what that's going to entail. Who is, who is teaching these courses? I mean, I know teachers are, but I mean, what are the requirements for teaching this course? The only requirement from VDOE is that it's a licensed teacher. So we're going to recruit teachers to, who would like to teach that course. And, and are we recruiting teachers who want to teach this? Yes. That's the plan. Okay, because um, that, that would always be my concern is making sure that some, somebody was... T because first of all, if you teach something you, you don't really want to teach... Right, the preparation the is not as good as... And we're going to try to address that. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you all. Um, I just want to thank staff for their hard work on this. Um, this year, the state came through with some pretty sweeping changes, and making that work for our program of study was no small task. So thank you for doing that. I know it was a lot of work, and, and I appreciate it. Um, I think uh, a, a couple things, let me talk about world language first. Um, I, I think it would be helpful as you go through a process, I mean, because we understand you'd like to make changes, and I think everybody su supports that idea, but um, just maybe g getting a little bit more information or understanding um, prior to having to take a vote. So I wonder if sometime in the next nine months or so we can get an update on your progress uh, as you, um, you know, kind of... Um, um, go through that process and, and finalize, uh, even if it looks the same, it would be helpful to just keep, be kept abreast of that. Um, particularly, um, I just, but I do want to um, kind of address a couple of things. If this, if the changes are, are, are driven by uh, student, student achievement, that would be good to know. If it's driven by resources, whether that's availability of teachers because there's teacher shortages or availability of funds because we don't have any local resources. I think that's a, a conversation we have to have um, uh, and, and let people know that, it, that it's a money issue. Also, I want to be clear that we are um, adopting new, we're aligning our graduation requirements as part of this vote with <coughs> the state, uh, um, which makes the um, <coughs> language in the standard diploma optional. Is that correct? Is that correct? The, the 22 credit diploma uh, world language is still going to be optional. In that. Is that correct? Yes. I just want to be very, I want I just, to just be crystal clear about sure that. I'm sure I understood your question. So. so graduation requirements and program of studies are, are linked, but I just wanted to be clear that the state handed that down and we are being compliant and consistent with the state. So, um, but anyway, and, and I, um, so if we could just get an update, that would be wonderful. And then with regard to the conversation about CTE, I think um, it would, I think two things, uh, you know, I don't, I want to make sure we're not inadvertently offering fewer choices, um, kind of the law of unintended consequences. And I know that it's dynamic and that students vote for, with their feet, and I get that. Um, but if we have, but, but cultures can build around class classes, and so that can create um, popular classes at one school that don't exist at another, and, and things trend, and that's great. But if there's a situation in which um, schools, students at certain schools are consistently not allowed or not having access to a program without having to get on a bus, I wonder if there's an opportunity to make sure that we're offering at least on some sort of rotation. And I don't, I don't know. That's going to take years to figure out, but it's something that um, 
we may have to look at um, as we start offering more. Um, if, if, if students are, you know, year after year, to your point, choosing that one class they want to take, and then they're having to go back and have that conversation with their counselor because it's the one they really want to take, and, you know, <coughs> four or five semesters in a row they can't get to it, you know, do we want to, you know, rethink about that so that the student doesn't have to get on a bus but can still take that course, um, assuming that it's being made elsewhere, you know, that we're not taking it out of the rotation entirely. So with that, um, if there's nothing else, um, the motion has been made to adopt the program of studies as amended by staff with regard to modern language and keeping modern language the same for this year, um, this upcoming school year. And with that, um, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. <laughs> Thank you all again for the good work. The program of studies has passed. That brings us to 11.01 .01 board members' comments. Mrs. Taylor? I have nothing. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Young? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the um, um, Jamestown High School for uh, presenting on uh, Concourse 9. I had the opportunity of uh, visiting their presentation. I, I, I love Link 5 and Concourse 9. One of the things that I loved about it is the idea that the, the teachers are, are now collaborating between the schools. I think that's wonderful. But I talked to students, and some of the things that I, I wrote down and, and they were reiterated over and over again was uh, and the things that we need as adults in our uh, pursuance of a job, but time management, uh, the fact that students are collaborating. Uh, we know that big companies like Microsoft, uh, that's one of their key things. They want collaboration. They want students that can communicate. And uh, I, I talked to a little girl who is, well, she's not little, please don't. Uh, she's a young lady who is in the ninth grade who obviously had learned a lot because her communication skills are excellent. <laughs> She was able to explain to me the program. She was able to tell me uh, the things that she had learned through this and how it was going to benefit her in the future. So I, I love that. Um, the idea that they were going to get more credits, um, the fact they enjoyed meeting new people, and uh, one of the challenges, um, again, was time management um, and coping with all the homework. That was a favorite. It's all the homework. Um, but it was uh, project-based and used a lot of technology. And I just want to congratulate uh, the Concourse 9 faculty and staff for uh, making that possible for us to uh, participate in. So I want to thank them and thank the students for their amazing work. And I love the sculptures. So, Thank you, Mrs. Young. Dr. Beers? Yeah, I've got a, I, just a couple of things. See, I'm sorry Dr. Carroll had to leave. I, one... Uh, one um, thing I think it would be helpful in the future, and I um, and I think the word language teachers um, uh, were concerned about changes that were made last year, and were not um, apprised of those changes. And and I and I believe that the reason we heard more from them um, this time because they became aware of the changes. What I would suggest in the future is that if, if, if significant, and I considered some of these significant changes, curriculum changes, um, are, are going to be changed or modified or eliminated, is that the um, folks most responsible for that, not so much central office people, but the world language teachers, if, it, if it's um, language or the science, high school science teachers, if it's high school science, that they be um, very much involved in this process. Um, I, I just think, um, I'm not sure that has been going on for the last few years, but I think it's very important um, to do that. Um, um, the, other, uh, the other thing I would, I would also, that I would like to say um, is I very much want to congratulate, well, before I say that, um, I spent almost all of Saturday in a very hot, steamy um, gymnasium at um, 
Churchland High School down in um, uh, Portsmouth, uh, Virginia, which was hosting the Division IV um, Wrestling Championship. And um, I very much, um, and I, I, one thing I will tell you, because I remember seeing my mother do this as well many, many years ago, I have never seen so many moms turn into pretzels as they were watching their sons wrestle. Um, and, and there was a lot of this, <coughs> but I remember that. And um, I very much, um, um, and, and, and the thing I felt what was really important for me is that um, that um, gymnasium was absolutely packed. Absolutely packed. You, 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 there was no room to stand anywhere there. Um, and um, um, there happened to be, uh, I believe, four, 13, 13 high schools in the division, in their particular division, because there's an A, B, C, D. Um, and there are 14 weight classes for each school. So there are 182 wrestlers that were there. And um, Malik Barr from Warhill High School, and uh, Everett Green um, from uh, Lafayette um, High School won the state wrestling championship uh, for their particular weight. Um, there were eight additional students who came in third place um, and, and, um, in, in that same tournament. Lafayette finished fourth War Hill finished sixth, and Jamestown finished a distant 11th, 11th but um, I, uh, it just reinforced that wrestling is very much alive and well um, as, a, as a viable sport. Um, and, and, if you, and if you have an opportunity to go to a match, you have no idea of the dedication, the sacrifice, the um, incredible diets, weight training that um, that uh, these students go through um, to make that to to achieve that so uh, my hat certainly off to them and I will be sure to catch more of those wrestling matches um, next winter that's all I'm done Mr. Kelly no ma'am not going to try to follow that <laughs> she can speak for Ms. Ownby <laughs> I know but I, I can't follow that alright great Ms. Hummel I think I said plenty tonight. <laughs> Ms. Ombi. I just wanted to share, I had an opportunity to attend Lafayette's um, photography, visual arts um, show last Friday. Um, this was a, a, a first. They, they typically have a big show in the spring, and so this was um, the first time this year they decided to have um, a fall slash winter showing of the students' um, art, and I'm always impressed and awed. Um, so that was a wonderful opportunity to engage our students and, and ask each of them how they, what their vision was for incorporating the art and visual arts in their long-term career plans. And wanted to thank our, our Ram Nation students for speaking tonight. I think they did a very well, um, a very good job of representing their school. Ms. Young and I had an opportunity to, um, I thought maybe she would say something first, but we volunteered at a Hornsby Band booster dance a couple weeks ago. And so, <clears throat> again, I think, those, those events are so important in the lives of our students. So academics are important, but um, Mr. Chikorita's talked about the culture of school. And so having students have the opportunity to, you know, to have um, time to be together um, when they can have fun and talk about the culture of the school and, and build those lifelong um, friendships is just really fun. And when you add a neon dance, it's just like, it's the bomb. So wanted to share that experience and had fun with Mrs. Young doing that. Yeah, can I just add one thing? I still can hear, <laughs> which was, but I really uh, kudos should go to Miss Ownby. She had a large part to play in that, and it was outstanding. I worked with a young man that um, was was from Hornsby High School, from Hornsby Middle, but wasn't at the dance there. He was there to make money. Boy, did he instruct me on how to do that. So I really enjoyed that. But thank you, Miss Ownby, for allowing me that opportunity. I'm glad you got to go. But are you feeling better? Oh, yes, I feel wonderful tonight. <laughs> Antibiotics are great. <laughs>
Um, yeah, I'd like to echo Mr. Kelly's uh, thanks for, for the speakers, particularly the students. They, they, they uh, represented well, and it was really great to hear from them. Uh, I also wanted to echo um, Mrs. Young's comments about Concourse 9. I, too, had the opportunity to be there with Dr. Heron and uh, several members of s uh, staff, um, Ms. DePaula, I saw there. Um, and it was um, it was tremendous. It's, it's really good work going on in the high schools, and uh, there's lots to be proud of. So thank you all for everyone who had something. I see you there, Mr. Baker. Were you there? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I have a bad memory. And then lastly, I just, the, we, it is the time of year where we appreciate our clerk. The best gift we could have given her tonight was a short meeting. Sorry. Uh, appreciate <laughs> that. We didn't. Maybe next time. Um, but anyway, thank you for all you do, Janet. I don't think anyone uh, truly understands the uh, amount of work that uh, Ms. Serza does to keep us in line and make sure that we follow all the laws and the rules and follow our own rules and the state's rules. So um, thank you very much for all you do. We really do appreciate you. <laughs> anyway, so there's nothing else. Okay. Um, that brings us to 12.01 upcoming meetings. The school liaison committee meets on the 28th of February at 7.30 a.m. Uh, at central office, uh, at James Blair Central Office. The policy committee also meets on the 28th at 8 a.m. Um, <laughs> in room oh, three. That's going to be a busy morning there at the annex. And then also on the 28th, the 21st Century and Career Ready Advisory Committee meets at 3.30 p.m. in the annex. And then on the 8th of March, SEAC meets at 6.30 in the evening at the rec center on Long Hill Road. And then 12.02 upcoming meetings. We have on March 6th, the closed session at 6 p.m. Um, at the at the annex, the school board office, followed by a public hearing on the proposed budget that we heard tonight at 6.30, also on March 6th in the annex, uh, the school board central office at James Blair, followed immediately by a work session and action items um, in the annex. On the 16th of March, we have a joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors and City Council. That's at 9 a.m. in Legacy Hall. The county is hosting. And then our second March meeting begins with a closed session at 6 p.m. here in Building F um, on the 20th, and then followed by a regular meeting at 6.30 uh, here on the dais. So if there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned.